Well, hello and welcome everybody to the general committee meeting. I declare the meeting open and we begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet, which is the Cubby Cubby or Gubby Gubby people, and pay our respects to our elders past, present and future. We have everyone in attendance. May we have someone to confirm the minutes of the general committee meeting from the 12th of April 2021. I've moved Joe Jurisovic, seconded Councillor Stockwell, all in favour. We have no presentations, we have no deputations. Councillors, just begin with a gentle reminder about we have staff here for questions. Um, if we can limit our questions for information only and save our points, if we wish to make points, save it for formal debate. And in debate, gentle reminder that we allow all councillors to speak uninterruptedly and uh, that we debate the councillors and not the staff. Um, we have some items referred from committees. The first is the representations to a development permit for material change of use for a food and drink outlet at 1 Arcadia Street, Noosa Heads. And we have Kerry Core of Management and Planning here for any questions, councillors? Well, I'll start. Yeah, yeah, no, no, it's not on the stand of ceremony. Oh, 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 I've got Monday orders, I really have. Um, thank you, uh, Mr Chair. Um, question, Kerry, this is about a dining application for one premises in Arcadia Street, those heads, but we seem to have been inundated overnight by a, a series of emails from um, um, uh, so parties in the uh, in the junction area suggesting that uh, this is to do with um, dining uh, uh, changes to the to the Noosa Plan 2020 to do with all dining uh, establishments. Can you um, clarify why we seem to have uh, that perception from uh, from riders and uh, and how it relates to just one application that we have before us? Okay, so the the application before us seeks a negotiated decision. So it seeks to change conditions of the approval for the restaurant that were issued. So that's the application that we need to look at today. Um, I think this has arisen uh, for traders in the junction because the hours of operation in the junction are perhaps a bit overly restrictive. And I'm certainly recommending some changes to the hours uh, in the conditions. And I think it's also something that we should look at in a future review of our planning scheme. So the changes made, they say there were changes made to the Noosa Plan 2020 with regard to operating hours of uh, dining establishments. That's right. So under the 2006 scheme, there was really uh, no conditions of operation uh, for the junction. Typically, they all operated or were allowed to operate till midnight. Um, under the new scheme, it imposes some uh, different hours of operation, suggesting that uh, Friday and Saturday night, they can operate till midnight, but after that they should close at 10 p.m. And just to clarify, and I might just jump in there. And the um, <coughs> Junction Association is asking to have a look at you know how did that process work, and I'm digging into that at the moment. I've probably got about 80 percent of the information I need to be able to answer that question, but haven't um, haven't got all the answers. Um, but what I'll do is I'll go back to the Noosa Junction Association and explain <coughs> that process, and I'll copy in all councillors for information as well when I have that information. Thank you, Brett. Just to clarify, that differentiation in the new planning scheme has no, sorry, that change in the new planning scheme has no differentiation between indoor and outdoor dining times. Is that correct? Uh, currently, uh, I'm recommending a change to yes, the Yes, but in the, in the Noosa plan as it stands, there was no differentiation between indoor and outdoor dining time? No, not for the hours. But traditionally, we've always had a different closing time for <coughs> outdoor areas and indoor areas when applications for dining have come before us. Uh, traditionally, we have in areas that are in close proximity to residential uses because okay. uh, the outdoor dining area is an area that's difficult to <coughs> manage noise and mitigate noise because there's no measures really that you can impose um, that help to address it. Okay, so what you're recommending today in this, in this is a change to an, a restriction of outdoor dining time which is different to indoor dining. That's right. So I am I'm recommending a change to what the scheme suggests is appropriate for the junction. I think that is overly restrictive. But I am recommending that Thursday to Sunday we restrict the outdoor dining area to 10pm. Now that means the indoors could operate seven days a week till midnight. Okay. So it's just the outdoor that's the recommendations around. Thank you. 
Kerry, in regard to um, a level playing field, can the area, the businesses or the restaurants in uh, close proximity, um, some of them, quite a few of them actually, they currently though are allowed to uh, dine until midnight, seven days a week outside, aren't they? Um, there are um, numerous premises in the junction mm -hmm. that don't have um, limits on their hours of operation. But on review, many few choose to operate that way. They, many of them shut 10 p.m., um, except maybe Friday and Saturday night. There are certainly some premises that op operate until midnight more than just a Friday and Saturday, but they're, they're few and far between. So, but the option's open if they want to do that. There is the option yeah. open to them. And Eddie, Eddie Chiba's, which is right next door to the new, to the new applicant, that, that actually can have outdoor dining until midnight, seven days a week. Question. Yeah, that's a question. question. Yes, that, that is a question. Yeah, so I, I have undertaken a review of the properties next door and I'm just having a look. Eddie Cheapers at the moment advertises their opening hours um, to be 11 p.m. Wednesday and Thursday and 12 a.m. Friday and Saturday. So um, that's, that's their advertised hours, what's on their website. Um, Kerry, in regards to existing and new businesses um, that are covered under the new NUSA plan, which requires them to be closed outdoors um, by 10 p.m., if they were to make an application for outdoor dining, um, my understanding that will trigger an MCU. Can you explain that? Yeah. So and also explain um, the cost of um, making an application for a material change of use. Yeah. So under both the 2006 scheme and the 2020 scheme, if people wish to do outdoor dining and they've never had approval before in the junction, would have required an application to be made to council. So that's not new. That's something that's been in since February 2006. Um, and the requirement is there in order to review potential impacts of noise, but also to review potential increases in car parking demand because you have a greater dining area, potentially attract more customers, and you require more car parking. So can I um, ask for further clarification? If I make an application for outdoor dining um, and the space then adds to my GFA and may trigger then parking contributions, is that what you're saying? That's right. Um, that's right, exactly right. Um, now, many of them, when they do so, because there's exemptions for kitchen, they will propose from parking. Um, and the way the scheme has, the changes in the scheme, it, it results in essentially a lot of the businesses proposing an outdoor dining area that's equivalent to their kitchen, and there's no requirement for car parking because their kitchen becomes exempt. So, so what are the cost implications of that? So to make a, an application for, um, an outdoor dining permit, the cost of an acoustic um, report, um, and potentially cost of car parking um, infrastructure charges. Can you give me an idea of what a small business may have to incur? Is the point of order. I think we're going in very general territory rather than into the matter before us here. I don't think that's relevant to deciding this application. Um, look, I'll allow a question. Okay, so um, costs, uh, our council's application fees are based on the size of the area that's proposed, so it will vary depending on the size. Um, typically for a restaurant it's around $5,000 application fee uh, to council, um, but if they were proposing a very small area there's an opportunity to also ask for a fee variation around that. Um, an acoustic report, uh, which was asked for on this development if they wanted to be outside, um, it, it, that's obviously done by a private consultant, so, so it can vary. Um, reports can vary between, I think, two and $5,000. And infrastructure charges, car parking, car parking contributions, contributions in um, Lucy Junction? Yeah, I, I believe it's $15,000 a space, but can I come back to you on that one? I've got it here. So potentially we're looking at 15, 20, up to $35,000 for a small business to make an application for an outdoor dining permit. For approval for, for an approval. Yeah, and as I said, 
what a lot of the businesses are doing is making sure their outdoor dining area matches the same size as their kitchen and then there's no car parking contributions payable. Kerry, if I, I've got a, a, a schedule here that says current, this could be wrong, as at the 18th of May, Noosa Heads, Noosa Junction, $24,000 car parking yeah, contribution. Thank you, that, that would be right. So you mentioned that, that the use of the um, more restricted dining uh, hours or in outdoor areas was an attempt to reduce noise nuisance. Is there any, and you, you know, it is typical that 10pm is used, is there any, have, have you had to find out whether there is any increased um, requirements from others in terms of uh, noise generation after between 10 and 12? Certainly liquor licensing have different levels around noise. Um, obviously they allow more noise to be made before 10 p.m. After 10 p.m. there's an expectation that it reduces. Mm -hmm. um, but I haven't been able to find out further for you. Okay. So in, in more general terms, there there is you know, requirements for noise generation that we would have put, whether it's 10 or 12 with, with or without a licence, there is a, you know, a requirement. If we can't control it by dining hours, would, there is options to say, well, this is what you need to uh, keep to in terms of noise generation. Yes, um, that is an option for Council to impose a condition around decibel ratings for for businesses that operate after 10 p.m. or even before 10 p.m. to try and set a suitable level. Um, the issue with that and why officers didn't recommend it is it's very difficult uh, to manage and implement and do enforcement on. Um, so it's, it's not, because um, you're essentially having to tell people to be quiet while they're enjoying their outdoor dining area. Is there any request from the applicant to have amplified music outdoors after 10 p.m.? Sorry, you repeat it? Is there any request from this applicant to have out, um, amplified music outdoors or music of any sort outdoors after 10 p.m.? Yes, that's one of the um, conditions that the applicant has made representations on. They are seeking um, that um, amplified music be allowed till, till midnight. Are there any other businesses in that precinct that have amplified music outdoors till midnight? There is at least one in the junction, um, and that business is causing issues for residents up the hill. Joe, just with regard to amplified music, um, under my uh, um, understanding of amplified music uh, would have resulted from, would have been uh, in reference to live music and or uh, speakers in the outdoor area. Uh, is there any differentiation between um, and can only be amplified music that is. Uh, Put through speakers through the indoor area as a, you know an, an ambient background noise for for um, for diners as opposed to what's what's placed outside. Are we able to differentiate between the two and uh, allow um, an element of um, mood music, if you like, uh, within the indoor dining space? Uh, yeah, certainly. Um, if they go through speakers, there's the ability to put a noise limiter on them and to limit the noise that comes out of the speakers in the first place. So that is, that is something generally that can, can be managed reasonably well. It does come at a cost because you've got to have a noise limiter to do so. Um, and yeah, they are different. Um, mm. Whether something is amplified by speakers can cause greater issue than if it's just a, a guitar, an acoustic guitar. Okay. I've noticed um, that the on Bottle Brush Avenue, which is right next to the, the closest group of houses to the junction, is on Bottle Brush. That's high density on, th on that side of the street. And then once you go to the other, the next block up is low density. Is there a difference between how the noise from the uh, junction will affect? Is there a different expectation for a high density area than the behind it, the, the low density area? Because that first line of houses is high density. Would they would do they have the same expectation? Um, for for noise. Yeah. Um, well, I would think that if you are opposite the roads to a business centre, you would have some expectation that there would be noise coming from the property, uh, no doubt. Um, in, in compared to houses up the hill, you know, they're further away. They wouldn't expect to um, hear the noise. And certainly, you know, in past years, many of our businesses in the junction closed fairly early. 
and didn't create any of those issues for residents up the hill. So this is something new that we're seeing. We are getting complaints from residents up the hill who are hearing those businesses that have music, amplified music outside, but also hearing patron noise quite late into the night. I'll probably just add to that. There, there may also be a difference in the, the type of residence. So, you know, if someone who's moved in more recently when they're used to or understand that the junction is now operating later at night than it would have five or ten years ago, their expectations might be different for someone who perhaps lived there for 10, 20 years when things were quieter when they bought the property and now they're finding that their amenity is being impacted. So there's probably a couple of different categories of residence as well. Mm -hmm. Sorry, um, can I ask um, how many complaints, um, are they written complaints and can we get a copy of the complaints and sort of understand what the noise issues are? Um, uh, yes, we can, we can look at that. Um, so some of the complaints go to our environmental health, yep. some have come to property given the twilight markets operating yep. and some have come to planning. So it might take a little bit but I can try and Just get those to Just to understand them. what the issue is, whether yep. it's amplified music, um, whether it's patron music, yeah, um, it's that would be great. Definitely both. Um, I checked in with our environmental health officers yep. and they were saying the noise complaints they're getting is mostly like patron noise. It's mainly patron noise. Mainly patron noise. Mainly patron noise. Yeah, it also gives an idea of where the receptors of that, that, that noise are oh, in yeah. relation to uh, where the noise is being generated. Yeah. Yeah. One conversation at a time, please, Councillors. Um, did you have a question you wanted to ask? Yeah, I do, Kerry. So just to reiterate with the amplified music, um, 9 p.m. Sunday to Thursday is the current condition, and 10 p.m. Friday and Saturday. So, just um, I'm not musical, so I'm an amp like just to clarify that amplified means that they can still have low music playing, or is that just all music off altogether? So, amplified music is when it's plugged into an electric system. So, even if it's a, say a, a soft music going in the background, that's then considered amplified. That's right. So that any any music whatsoever is ceasing. Just well, a guitar or uh, they can have an acoustic guitar <coughs> singing. It's not amplified. It's not going through an electronic system to amplify it. So they can have a, an acoustic guitar until midnight mm. if they want to. Yeah. Uh, yes. On um, is that Friday on any night? Because it's only amplified. No, no it's until ten p.m. So ten p.m. at the moment. Oh, I, if yeah, under that right. Kerry, does um, legal licensing? Sorry. I think I need to clarify that. So amp Amplified is plugged into an um, electronic system. Okay, so if you had a guitar that's not plugged in, they, there'd be no restrictions on that in terms of hours. What about voice on a microphone? That's Amplified. Oh, that's amplified. Yeah. So it's controlled by the condition. Gary, does liquor licensing have any obligations to police sound levels coming from these outdoor areas after 10 p.m.? Mm. Um, they, they do, um, but they respond to uh, complaints and they respond to whether there's a breach of their conditions. Um, so what I'm finding with liquor licensing, because planning review or liquor license when they come into council, is that liquor license are looking more and more for council to set the direction for a local area and what's appropriate in terms of noise levels, operating hours, everything. So is there a, a, an independent standard that they apply regardless? Um, there is a standard, uh, and you would find, um, which is in place for the businesses down in the junction that we're getting complaints about. So has, has liquor license, licensing taken action against any businesses? It's compliant there? with their conditions. Pardon? It's compliant with their conditions, is my understanding. So the noise levels set by liquor licensing yes. are quite generous and allow quite a bit of noise to be made. Okay. My understanding, Kerry, is that liquor licensing only um, regulates noise emanating within the premises, not outdoor dining. Is that right? No, they look at both. They do look at both. Yeah. Okay, and I think the question that Frank was starting to ask but didn't um, quite get there was: Have we? Are we aware of complaints that have been dealt with by liquor licensing with regard to noise in the in the area? Um, I wasn't, but that's a good question. I thought that's where you were. I thought that's what you started. Joe, it's a good one. Sorry, I thought that's what you started to say. That was that was yeah. where I thought you were going. Um, liquor license don't contact us generally in okay. terms of the complaints. So we have no and way of knowing what they. No. Yeah, right. And for privacy reasons, they don't share the complaints they get with council either. Okay. Thank you. Um, certainly, there's been a couple of businesses such as. Um, oh, what's it, the one on the corner of uh, Noosa Drive and Bottlebrush? recently shut down. Uh, 
Little, was it Little, little Sister? Sister? They certainly shared that one with us okay. um, because, you know, the approval was lapsing, so they were keen mm. to understand that. Okay. No big complaints about that Thank one. You. Would it be irregular to have a condition that allows outdoor dining but prevents amplified music outdoors to meet them? Would that be unusual? No. Thank you. Now, um, if I can, yeah, so page 33 and 34, um, it's probably worth you explaining the difference between a performance outcome and an acceptable outcome in that a lot of the uh, the communications uh, both in this side is relate, relating to uh, the setting of acceptable outcomes but can you explain um, what the, the performance outcome which is live music creates entertainment for patrons involvement to be within the streetscape and is cited to avoid significant impacts on surrounding residential land uses whether it's mandatory to achieve that by the acceptable outcomes or otherwise. Okay, so under the planning legislation, um, people are required to meet the performance outcome. Okay, so the performance outcome of the scheme. The acceptable outcome is one way of meeting the performance outcome. So if council was satisfied with the proposed change in hours met that outcome, then you would be voting consistent with the planning scheme. That let me say that again? Yes, yes say that again. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the planning legislation requires people to meet the performance outcome. Okay, so that's the left hand side, PO14. The acceptable outcome on the right hand side, which is where the hours come from, is one way of meeting the performance outcome. So what we have here is AO14. So if, if you meet those hours, then you're clearly considered to meet the performance outcome. Yeah. Or you may scheme. be able to put forward another way to achieve that performance outcome. Yeah. So yeah. With, re with relation to acceptable outcomes, AO14.1 doesn't apply here because the site is not adjacent to land yeah. in a residential zone? Wouldn't that be correct? That's right. There's a number so, of scenarios so there. 14, 14 uh, so 14.2, acoustic live music system to operate in outdoor spaces, by time in Hastings Street, mixed use Green Street, Joyners to Junction Hospitality, and 14.3. So 14.2 and 3 would apply here. Yes. That's right. Now, a follow up question on that. If the applicant, as in this case, um, doesn't wish to meet, wants to meet the criteria, but not the acceptable outcome, so wants to meet the performance outcome, is that generally why when we ask for an acoustic report? That's, that, that, that's correct. That they have to justify that it can occur without significant That's interest. right. That's and right. the lack of that is is you have no information to base yeah. an assessment on. Yeah, you have no information to determine whether the buildings are located in a way that will um, mitigate noise for residents up the hill. Do you read those outcomes, Kerry, um, in the context of the purpose? or the aim of the major centre zone and the Junction Hospitality Precinct. Um, so I've got in front of me that, you know, the aim is development specifically, development specifically supports and provides entertainment, including live entertainment in suitable locations in premises such as cafes, restaurants, bars, nightclubs, cinemas and markets. Um, and suitable, these suitable locations where entertainment uses and street activation is encouraged and may occur into the evenings and late nights. So you've got to read one in context of the other. Um, the, two are the two must be read together. Yeah, well, both, uh, both requirements apply. Um, and as, you know, as was pointed out with the performance outcome, if you meet that, then you would be consistent with those higher order provisions around providing an area in the junction for late night entertainment. Yep. But it's about going through the process of demonstrating that you're not going to cause mm. significant impacts on nearby residents. Yeah, so it's to permit the, to, 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 to permit the activity, but to have restrictions on uh, the the time so that it doesn't, uh, yeah, as you said there, it doesn't affect the amount of the yeah. by residents. Yeah. yeah, and certainly the junction, you know, it's it's a major centre for the Shire. It's an area where we want to encourage um, entertainment and, and some nightlife, um, but it's about a balance in, in looking after residents nearby. 
I'll try a motion. Um, it's it's going to involve a change to A3. So it would say uh, agree. Agree to right. So agree to amend conditions three, six, and nine to read as follows: the approved use can operate during the hours of. During the hours of 6 a.m. to 12 a.m., seven days a week. Full stop. Full stop. Strike. Get the rest of that. But then leave the clause about amplified music as is. And the rest of the, the motion as is. Can I suggest then you just read clause three out for those who are watching? Yes. So, so it condition can be, three would read as follows. Condition three reads as follows: the approved use can operate during the hours of six a.m. to twelve a.m. seven days a week. And condition six: amplified music must cease to operate in outdoor spaces by nine p.m. Sunday, Thursday, be ten p.m. Friday to Saturday, and the rest of the. The motion is remains the same. May I have a seconder for that, please, uh, Councillor Lawrence? Thank you, Councillor. I do this because um, consistency is important, and uh, we've got a situation where historically other businesses in this precinct have been able to operate to midnight seven days a week, but we also have to balance um, uh, negative impacts uh, on the nearby residential areas. I think. It's fair to say that there is an expectation that there will be patron noise seven days a week from the junction, which is a hospitality precinct seven days a week, uh, into the night. But the one thing that does have the potential to really interfere with uh, residential amenity is amplified music in outdoor areas. And for that reason, I feel um, amplified music for 10 p.m. on a Friday and a Saturday night is sufficient. Um, a lot of the uh, patrons may have already left by then. There could be music quite. There could be music inside the the, the facility um, after that time. That's still permitted, so they can still enjoy uh, music at the facility inside after 10 p.m. to midnight on Friday and Saturday, and also from 9 p.m. to midnight on Sunday to Thursday. But no amplified music in the outdoor areas in those hours. I think this is a, a good balance. What we're trying to achieve that is consistency with what's allowed in other um, businesses in the junction and also um, recognition that amplified music does have the potential to travel and also disturb the nearby uh, residences. I'd like to make an amendment to that um, Council Walker's motion yeah. uh, to include the review. Um, we've received um, a number of emails from our associations. Yeah, so we have a second of a please. I'll read that first. Yeah. 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 The CEO be requested to include a review of the operating hours of licensed premises a part of the next package of amendments of the new new NUSA plan 2020, and that as part of that review process, consultation occur within the community and business associations. And Brett, just to clarify, does licensed premises <coughs> or outdoor dining be included in that? I think or would does that need to be included? Oh, sorry. The review of the operating hours of licensed premises, well, which includes outdoor, outdoor which dining, or is that taken as... That would be covered by the... If you want to put it in, you can clarify, but I think it would probably be covered by the <coughs> licensed premises because the licence would extend to the outdoor areas. Wouldn't? It does extend... The licence does extend to the outdoor dining areas. But you can add, you can add that. Do, do we need to? A cafe may not have... Um, a liquor like license, for example. You can maybe just put which includes outdoor dining. Okay. Does that need to be clarified if the outdoor dining is on public land or private? No, that wouldn't matter. No, the planning scheme just applies to private. Okay. Can we add it to that amendment and residence? It does say that it says community and business you've association. Second, you've seconded the motion. Oh, um, oh excuse me. I've seconded the motion. You've seconded. We can we can have further amendments if. Yeah, right. Seconded by Councillor Lawrence. No, she can't. She can't. Seconded she by Councillor Pinzel. That's right. Claire, you wish to speak to uh, Look, just, just that I think this is important. We've had um, a number of correspondence from our associations um, requesting 
or asking us questions, and I think it's a prudent time. Our CEO has um, insti- you know, told us that he's looking into this matter. I think it's a prudent time that we do engage with our um, community as well as our business associations in regard to this review um, of, of these hours. I think it's very important. They haven't had the opportunity specifically to make um, comment on this, and I think it's something that we need to hear from them, and we also need to hear from our community. So I'd like uh, that we undertake a proper consultation in regard to this going forward or a review um, at whenever, you know, at the earliest time. Any other councillors wish to speak to the amendment? Uh, yeah, look, I'll support the amendment. I think uh, it's pertinent that uh, we do review these uh, things from time to time and we've had some uh, some input from uh, the business community that uh, they uh, feel there's, uh, there's room there and scope there to uh, to review what we've, uh, we've put in. They don't uh, feel like they were um, sufficiently Consult at the time of the uh, of the process, so I'm happy to, uh, to to see as part of the package of the, uh, the next lot of amendments that uh, we do uh, include a, a review of operating hours in the, in these areas. Mm. Councillor Pinsley. Yeah. yeah, I'm happy to support the amendment. Um, we all support community consultation because further down the track, we realise that that's good governance and people begin to trust our leadership decisions. I think it's good. Um, I myself received correspondence over the weekends from all the business groups and communities. So I think it's timely given um, the fundamental changes through lifestyle with the outcomes of COVID and those impacts uh, socially and economically on our community. I think it's a good time to go back to community and revisit because change is fundamental at the moment. And as we know, community finds challenges around change. And it's up to us to have the vision to move forward and collectively consult with all players on the field to make sure all voices are heard and that they are considered in our decision making. So I support the Mayor in this Thank you. today. Thank you. Councillor Robinson. Um, Tom, you can go first. Oh, just quickly, um, we all know that the junction is on the precipice of great changes mm. and we do want to have as much consultation about this to get a clear vision of what, how the playing field is, to, to know where the playing field, the lumps are or whatever going forward so that there's certainty amongst people that are willing to invest and, uh, and make it better. Councillor Robinson. Um, I'm happy to support the amendment. Um, in particular, a review of the requirements for outdoor dining. I'm really concerned um, about the cost, the cost of MCU, the cost of potential car parking contribution, the cost of acoustic reporting. I think that as a council, if we're genuine in our support for small business, then we must be genuine in our (coughs) intent to remove the barriers that set them up for failure. And I think the potential of applying for an outdoor consent that's going to trigger an MCU that will cost a small business upwards of 44000 um, is something that's going to set them up for failure. But more, more importantly, what I'm concerned about, that it's going to have an undesirable outcome for, yeah. uh, I've seen businesses revert back to, t- oh, sorry, Richard, an out- under- chair, sorry. Um, what I'm more concerned about is the undesirable or unintended consequence of that, which may see businesses like Light Years, like Tacos, um, revert back to 10 p.m. in an area that's been clearly identified as outdoor um, entertainment. So happy to support a review um, that encourages consultation. Um, again, we must commit to consultation with community. This is how we make better decisions and this is how we build more united and stronger communities. Thank you. Okay, Stuart, do you wish to close? No, no, I'm sorry, bro. I wasn't going to talk, but um, it's really important to focus on what the amendment says and not what it doesn't say. So it talks about a review of operating hours of licensed premises. There's a whole lot of new material which is based on a number range of assumptions which is painting a worst case scenario in the last, um, present uh, last speech, and I refute them. I think the new scheme has done a lot to encourage this nature of activity. Um, it's always easy to add up costs um, and and paint uh, this as a move to be nice to small business. 
In reality, any business establishing will have some level of planning approval. What this motion talks about is that we may have the acceptable outcomes a little bit off. It doesn't mean that you can't vary the acceptable outcomes, as we've just established. What it says is maybe we can be have a look at those acceptable outcomes and tweak them to achieve. So it's it's uh, probably really what it's doing is reducing the cost of having to do a um, a sound report for things like we're currently getting if they comply with the new acceptable outcomes. It's not going to this concept of whether car parking contributions are required, whether an MCU is required. They'll vary from site to site, from business to business, and there's many, many places in the Shire where people can have outdoor dining without incurring 44,000, and I don't want to see the headlines tomorrow, uh, quoting inaccurate or at least worst case scenarios. Just before we vote, I'll question. ask a question, if I may. Um, yeah, with regards to um, uh, what Councillor uh, uh, Stockwell was alluding to there, Kerry, um, I lost my train of thought, sorry. Um, uh, I've lost okay, sorry, I'll sorry. I'll, 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 I think you're going to say I was right. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I, was heading down, I, was, I, was, I was heading down a question just to, just to clarify. But uh, now I've lost my train of thought, sorry. Can I just make a comment sure, there? Down, no. Am oh, I allowed no, to speak? No. No. You, can, you can ask a question though, Karen, if you want. Uh, okay. Will this amendment um, support a more even um, advantage in terms of trade where some businesses now consider that they are disadvantaged because of the... Um, current yeah. restrictions of what the hours. What this amendment does is to ask staff to go back and have a look at what changes to the planning scheme should be made and to consult the community and the business community, the business associations on any potential changes. Those changes come back to council to make that decision. So whether they're equitable or you know, whether they're right, mm. that'll be council's decision. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I just yeah. remember what the question was relating to. Um, with regard to um, uh, costs like um, uh, MCUs and that, that would only apply where um, there is a change to the existing use. This would, that wouldn't apply where a restaurant is, is fitting into an existing restaurant which has existing right, existing use rights. Is that, uh, is yeah. that correct? It would only, only be triggered where um, a commercial premises is, is, is undertaking a complete change from what it has previously. That's right. It only um, applies for what's new. Yeah. If they don't have outdoor dining or they're expanding their building in some way, it applies then. So like, like for like, no, uh, that, that wouldn't trigger any issues, but only where that, that there's a significant yeah. change that triggers Yeah, that. existing use rights protected under the Planning Act. And look, I, I, of course, support the Mayor's Amendment. It's a good opportunity to address some inconsistencies that have developed in the junction through some historical approvals that have been given regarding the hours of operation and what's come in under the Nusa Planning Scheme. So, I, of course, I support the Mayor's Amendment. Thank you. Wish to close? No, I won't close. Thank you. Could put the amendment. Those in favour? <coughs> it's unanimous. Um, and now... The amendment now becomes part of the original motion, and only one council <coughs> just spoke to the motion. Council stop well done. While we're in the um, amendment phase, amendment phase, <laughs> I have a further amendment. I'll read it out. Um, that items B and C be amended to read include the following additional conditions: um, fifteen noise emanating from the internal premises, including amplified. Sorry, I'm still on my page. I think that condition 15 should say internal premises and outdoor dining area now. Noise emanating from the internal premises and outdoor oh, yeah. dining area. Sorry. How do you control painted noise? What do I do? You told me to apply. Including amplified or non amplified noise and painted noise must not exceed between 6 a.m. and 12 a.m., which is the proposed operating hours. 75 dBc fast response when measured approximately three metres from the primary source of the noise. Entertainers or speakers used to amplify noise must not be located in any outdoor dining area. Um, all amplified noise at the premises must be conducted through a sound limiting device at all times to ensure the noise does not exceed levels prescribed in the conditions of this licence. I'm sure that should say of a licence, not this licence. Yes. Um, the sound limiting device is to have a locking mechanism which is to be locked at all times except for inspection or maintenance work on the device. Access to the sound limiting device except for maintenance work is restricted to the licences, nominee and, and the persons in charge of the premises at any time. 
The sound limiting device must be checked and if necessary calibrated by a qualified acoustic engineer at least every 12 months to ensure compliance with conditions and applies. Evidence of the sound limiting device calibration must be made available to an authorised person on request. Can I ask a question, question. of the, uh, the uh, mover on this? Does the addition of outdoor dining area in 15 uh, negate or, or, or uh, unnecessary given that 16 suggests that the use to amplify noise must not be located in any outdoor dining area? Uh, no, because it deals with the non-amplified music as well. So there was there was a late amendment to the, the amendment prior to the meeting which took one condition out which dealt with outdoor separately. And if you, in 15, do you want the word between to follow the word exceed on the second line? Not it should, should not say must not exceed 75 dBC between 6 a.m. and 6 p.m. Must not exceed. Just the way that's written. Must not exceed 75. Yeah, 75 dBC between. Yeah. So if you move the 75 dBC, yeah, between still right there. Kathy, sorry. Sorry. Sorry, so I only thought of this last 75 night. 75 dBC should be before that. would be very helpful to try and get it ready for it now. I think that is more proof English. Yeah, that looks I was worried about the... the I guess you read that paragraph. Okay, so that paragraph now reads, Noise emanating from the internal premises and outdoor dining area, include, including amplified or non-amplified noise and paper noise, must not exceed 75 dBC between 6 a.m. to 12 a.m. Uh, fast response when measured approximately three metres from the primary source of noise. And before we have a second, I can ask you a question, Brian, is do, do these conditions reflect uh, liquor licensing? Requirements that currently exist. Could you ask that? <laughs> Do these conditions reflect current uh, liquor licensing No, they, they are conditions prepared by our environmental health. Um, the noise level set uh, will require a lower level, is my understanding, than what liquor license would typically impose. What would liquor licensing? I'd have to come back and check. Okay. So, so, question. question. Second. Okay, second for the for the purpose of debate. I'd ask right. second for the purpose of debate. Thank you, Joe. I okay, so now I can talk to So yeah, so this was my request to uh, the staff to bring forward a condition to contain noise levels to what's the acceptable limit. From memory, this is the sort of condition we put on places like Bounce, which was the backpackers um, that had a licensed area backing onto residential. It's similar um, to the sort of provisions that were discussed for the Sunshine Beach Earth Life Saving Club. So basically, I've got no problem with the operating hours, but I think if without the conduct of a, a noise report um, we have no ability uh, to suggest that they can operate in a way that the residents on the hill won't be affected so this is the limits suggested and process suggested by staff to set limits that would and, and monitoring mechanisms which allows us to say um, here's an acceptable level of noise the key criteria here is when we looked at creating the hospitality precinct we deliberately didn't call it an entertainment precinct because entertainment precincts have the ability for local governments to vary noise requirements of the state. We did literally said we wanted it to be low key, we wanted to have acoustic musicians etc etc. Um, that's the nature of the use. We are having problems and there would be nothing worse uh, for a emerging hospitality precinct to start having uh, some of the battles with local residents. Um, we have previously uh, had a community meeting where over 250 people turned up uh, about uh, music and noise in the junction when the local placemaking plan was put to the, to the community back in the Sunshine Coast Council area. Um, it's not meant to be overly restrictive and um, it's meant to set in a, no a reasonable noise limit. It's I think, yes, it's going to require this business to have uh, a response that's different to those who've had a historic response, but that is always the way. Um, we wouldn't be living in um, cyclone-rated houses if back in the 70s when we started to have the whole suburb being hit by cyclones, if we said, well, it's not fair, there has to be a little playing field that uh, all these people with houses that aren't constructed to cyclone rating uh, shouldn't be required to upgrade. I think it's about if we're going to set the limit, 
And without a sound report, this is what gives me confidence that this business can meet the, out the specific outcome that's in the planning scheme. Joe, you had a question. Question for Kerry. Um, condition 16 there, any planners or speakers use campfire noise must not be located in any outdoor dining area. Uh, one, it suggests, uh, firstly, that it, they could be located inside the premises. And secondly, is that a condition that applies to any of the other dining um, establishments in the area? Can they have, uh, otherwise, uh, in, in essence, can they have entertainers or speakers outside to amplify noise with time restrictions? Uh, it's certainly a condition that's been used before on properties that are in proximity to residential. Um, but the Noosa Junction, there are not many development approvals issued for the junction because they were issued many years ago. Yes, and those that were issued have very few conditions on them. Given that it's an, what, what are we clarifying? Enter, uh, not, enter, not, not entertainment, hospitality, um, uh, hospitality. hospitality precinct. Um, wouldn't there be expectations that amplified uh, external entertainers or speakers uh, would be used in premises in the area? We're not saying they can't. You know, part of We're not saying they can't. It's mm. that they can't have them outside. Oh, yeah. But I would expect they would have them inside. So that's what I'm saying. Doors are open and the noise would still be heard. Noise would still emanate out from inside the premises, yeah. but they can't be located outside. Uh, but Kerry, how, how, I think 75 DCB or something like that, DBC, how, how noisy is that? Do we know? Like, do we have any yeah, idea? Um, my understanding, and I probably need to come back to you on this, is the conversation level is around 65 DCB, so it's slightly higher than that. But That's not very high, so no. then you've got a lot can of can I come back to you on that? Yeah. yeah. Um, Kerry, is there any opportunity for us to run this past um, just our environmental staff um, and just maybe with just some, the business community? I just think it's mm. something that I haven't really got my head around, so I don't want to come and approve it and then find out afterwards mm. that it's not reasonable. Um, is there any way we can put this on pause until we get some further... Um, just further clarification and just further understanding of whether it's reason a reasonable cause or not. Yeah, um, so these conditions have been written by Environmental Health, okay. our offices. Um, we can, between now and the ordinary meeting, ask the applicant if they're willing to extend the negotiated period out yep. in order for the matter to be decided at a future council meeting. That would be excellent, thank you. Can I answer the question? Oh, yeah, go ahead. In terms of 75 decibels, so mm -hmm. let's look at um, uh, vacuum cleaner average radio examples given. Tom? See, if we're at normal at 65 conversation, Joe would probably be an 80. And I'm <laughs> very concerned that there will have no <laughs> Joe Go zones. So, <laughs> so I do not want a discrimination against Joe. Yeah, discrimination against me now. So the question is we, we were to, this couldn't happen. I mean, people with loud voices, they, they wouldn't. Would that fit into? what Brian is talking yeah. about. Look, I'll need to take the advice of our environmental health officers. Mm. Okay. Clearly, I can meet you, Tom. Worried about, about that. Um, yeah, putting aside the, the, uh, the shot at Councillor Drizzley. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the, um, the wording that's up there at the moment is neutral as to the source of the sound. It's about what the sound is, You know, what, whether it's by um, mm. music or by voices or whatever, it's about the sound level. So the question is whether that's the right level or if you want to have a DBA level actually imposed or not. That's the fundamental question. Kerry, um, when we impose con conditions on the Sunshine Beach Surf Club, how do they compare to, they were similar, <coughs> but in terms of yeah, decibel level? I'll have to go back and yeah. compare that. So I'll, speak, I'll speak to the motion. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the amendment. The amendment. Uh, look, I won't be supporting it in its current form, uh, simply because uh, we don't have sufficient uh, mm -hmm understanding of uh, the conditions as they stand. Um, I'm quite prepared to uh, to refer this to uh, further um, uh, further consideration with uh, with additional information uh, and I think other councillors uh, questions are, are relating to that. Um, but uh, the, the one that um, uh, particular condition that uh, irks me uh, as it stands is 16 uh, that, uh, that no uh, speakers or entertainers can be located in the outdoor dining area at, at any time that that re uh, results in any time of giving given the location is not in proximity to uh, directly direct proximity to uh, residential area and is in the Arcadia walk where 
um, uh, music is often um, often heard and uh, and quite uh, um, uh, a good area for uh, that sort of uh, activity. Um, I can't support it in its current form, but uh, I am prepared to uh, to seek further advice and uh, to review this to a further further consideration, either at Thursday night's meeting or. Uh, in a subsequent, me a subsequent uh, to uh, meeting from here, if uh, the uh, applicant is uh, is willing to uh, for him. Thank you, Joe. Any councillors wish to speak to the amendment? Mm -hmm. um, I won't be supporting okay. the amendment. We've just agreed that we would go back to community consultation. We've discussed unfair advantage in terms of trade, and given what's been said with the um, approvals in the past being made to operate, there's a lot of inconsistencies. Um, I'm not prepared to drill down to conditioning this at this point. Um, I agree with Councillor Jurasovic that uh, we need more information. Um, I just don't think we should be drilling down to the conditions at this point on this amendment without further um, consultation and uh, information. Councillor yeah, I won't be supporting it either. I mean, this is just so much red tape um, and I don't even I mean 75 DCB if we're talking now that worries me that that level is so low um, as the other councillors have said you know we need further information um, we have we need to take it out for community consultation but this to me is a whole lot of prescriptive conditions mm. that I think are unfair and it's certainly unfair um, with one business um, compared to all mm. the others so I won't be supporting this thank you uh, Councillor Lawrence? For all the reasons mentioned before, um, the amendment just in front of us, um, again, that presents more barriers for small business and um, is anti-competitive. Um, I will not be supporting it. Good. Any other councillors wish to speak to the amendment? Stop. Oh, yeah, okay. so I tend to agree that um, a, as we saw the ordinary meeting, we should get more advice. Uh, I tend to agree that we need to make sure that what staff have recommended is what we're expecting. Um, and if we are, aren't clear on what 75 decibels, if that is the right level through the, the whole day, um, I'm quite happy with that. I, I do think we have to be very mindful that we represent the whole community. And Noosa wouldn't be what it is unless we did approach development applications with the outcomes of the planning scheme in mind. And I'm quite happy uh, for the outcome to be achieved, but I'm not happy to suggest that just by opening up trading hours that it can be, because we've got no evidence to base. And I know a lot of councils talk about having an evidence base. So I do believe it's appropriate to uh, either restrict the licensing at the opening hours or have an expectation of noise which does not have a significant impact on the community, which is what the outcome is that we're discussing. Thank you, Councillor Stock. I'll put the motion. Uh, amendment. Those in favour? Against? <laughs> I'll move a procedural motion that the matter be deferred to the ordinary meeting to allow staff to provide an additional report which outlines um, the uh, an appropriate level of, of noise abatement or noise monitoring uh, and an indication of uh, conditions placed on previous hospitality uses the in the hotel is kept nailed down the wording further mm -hmm. so so the so the procedural motion is that the item be deferred yep. to the ordinary meeting yep. for consideration <coughs> oh, okay. further report from staff yep. addressing the following issues well, you've done that very well, you? <laughs> addressing the following issues number one <laughs> appropriate um, noise levels for business uses. Can I, can I perhaps just flag that 
if this list is going to be extensive, it no, might not be not. to be completed by staff by Thursday night. It yeah. might be conditional upon agreement by the applicant for this particular application. Okay. So yeah, and I just sort of, and an indication of it's about this application is what yeah. I'm getting at. An indication of the sort of, of conditions placed on hospitality uses in the Noosa locality. It's common, better, common, better yeah, so I think there's only two or three where we've done it recently. So what's, what are you looking Recent. for in the wording? Um, and they uh, advice uh, as to relevant similar conditions in recent approvals for hospitality operations in the Noosa Head area. Oh, well, four, five, six, seven postcode. And Nooserville, yeah, it's five, four, yeah. five, six, in, seven. In the Nooser area, just take out the heads. I'm going to be particular here. Like, um, I don't want to be a big search, so That's what from I'm Mary at. Street to Sunshine Beach search bar. Business, business, you want to write So six, six, seven, sorry, sorry, can I just jump in? Um, Councillor, we've got to be quite specific. Okay, if, if this, is, this is going to get too big. You're not an get indication. I don't, want to, I don't want to be an extensive I researcher, just an indication of the, I think, of a relevant similar condition. So if they find two or three, that'll give us an indication. Is that good enough? Is that? So, Kath, an indication of relevant similar conditions in recent approvals of hospitality operations in the Noosa area. In Noosa Lake, uh, Noosa Lake County. That excludes sanction. Uh, in no, it's, I'm, I'm just just, just explain what you're trying yeah, to do between the Nooseville Business District and the Sunshine and and Sunshine Beach Business District. How's that? Because I think there's only two or three. You want to, you want to say Hastings Street and uh, Noosa Junction? Let's be specific. specific. So, Kath, in the Noosa Heads, Noosa Junction, Nooseville. And Sunshine Beach oh, District. Yes. Where's that? There is. There is. And then if we come back to number one. Yeah. So again, that is a very generic um, issue that would be. Well, recommended for noise levels for business uses. Hospitality uses. Yeah. Oh, yeah, for hospitality uses. Would be more specific. It's only to live music, really, isn't it? It's nice, it's amplified as well. Live. Yeah, amplified live music. Amplified music. Mm. Um, but don't. Uh, well, I'm trying to get the in the in the, in similar. You're trying to find out whether 75 dBA yeah, is appropriate. Yeah, level. yeah. So and so but it may be if you're right beside the residence, it may be too too low in this situation in similar context, similar location. Similar context. I mean. Yeah. I would say hospitality uses in similar context. Rather than business use, Kerry, you're the one who's going to have to prepare this report. Does that make sense to you? And I don't mean that disrespectfully. But, you know, like we've got to work out, no, no, we've got to work. Oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah, you don't want to make bigger than that. I no. agree. It's, it's just the second one I'm okay with. Yes. That. I think the the first one we're really just wanting an understanding what seventy five dBA is and whether whether because eighty the noise level is going to vary yeah. depending yeah. on where you are yeah. in proximity to residential. That's right. We're talking so about we prox just, we're talking about yeah, proximity to to well, residential think, areas in this uh, area. Can I make a suggestion then? Yep. So first one would be more information about. Noise. What noise levels? What different noise levels mean in practical terms? Mean in practical terms and in the context of this application at Mercy Junction. Because that then puts well, whether second, whether that puts it's, it in, no, puts it in. that's about whether it's seventy five is right or, yeah. or whatever it might be. And really, uh, what we're dealing with is this application. We're not dealing with the broader issue. Yeah. We're dealing with this application. It refers to hospitality. That report is not the full review of all of the, the issues. It's about how you can make a decision on this application. And the first part of that additional information is, you know, what does seventy five mean? It's what's eighty mean? What's eighty five? I'll mean? second it. Thanks. And how does that then deal with um, this application at Mr. Junction in the context of? Local residents, and the second one is where have we imposed um, decibel 
limits in other applications in this in recent times. And understanding of the laws and wherefores of those. Okay, so that would be my advice. That if you're looking for a further report on a procedural motion, that would cover what you need to cover. Okay, we've got it. We've, it's been seconded. Councillors can ask questions after Councillor Stockwell has spoken to us. No, I, I just think from what people were saying is uh, there was a number of people who thought that they need more information to understand what 75 decibels is like, and I think there was another core core line of logic is about um, uh, being equitable uh, across businesses, and I think it's important to, to find out what we have imposed on other businesses to make sure that we are uh, approaching the, the issue in a consistent fashion. Yes. Councillor Finzo, you have a question? Yeah, I just have a question. I just need clarification. If it's a hospitality precinct, I thought that liquor licensing managed the noise. Kerry, do you want to explain the difference between a hospitality precinct and an entertainment precinct and a liquor place? Yeah. So, just to start with that question, um, hospitality is a term that council turned, has no meaning in terms of a liquor licence. Entertainment precinct is something recognised by the liquor licence, and that basically gives them a licence to make noise, and everybody else has to mitigate noise coming from the restaurants and bars. Um, so, that, that they're two different things. So certainly liquor licensing regulate um, all premises that are licensed um, and that will include hours of operation, uh, noise level, extent of dining, as well as some relevant ones about serving alcohol to people. Just to that, the entertainment precinct is, you know... Um, but I thought it was a hospitality precinct. Yeah, so they're two different things. So we've got the hospitality precinct in our funding scheme. The entertainment precinct is something in the, under the, the Liquor Act. Yeah. That's for things like Fortitude Valley in Brisbane. I think the Little Bar is one. I think there's one at the Gold Coast. We don't have any entertainment precincts under the Liquor Act in Merco. Um, hospitality precinct is an issue under our planning scheme, which is um, how we manage that, I'll call it that central area of, of um, Mercy Junction. So is that putting council in the role of mitigating noise through our decisions for the hospitality precinct? Well, to some extent, all planning decisions we have where there's um, conflict between uses, if it's noise versus industrial areas or this area, we do have that power to look at mitigating the impact of noise on adjoining neighbours. Um, so that could be in relation to a hospitality precinct, it could be in relation to industrial areas. Hmm. We do have that power to, to deal with the noise. So based on this application, going back to these acceptable outcomes, Herbert's, this is the application we're talking about, is this site adjacent to a residential zone? No, it's in Arcadia Way, so it's not adjacent to a residential zone, but noise from the junction is being Oops. heard by Sorry. residents who live on Nusa Hill. So they are experiencing and complaining about noise from businesses in the junction. And that's as much about the topography. You've got the sort of hill going up behind and noise is not necessarily screened as it goes up. Yeah. I'm just trying to work out why we're doing a procedural motion on this specific one, which seems broader than actually looking at the application in front of us. I can answer that question. That's why I was so particular about the wording in A, that it has to be in relation to this application. It's not about the entire review of all mm -hmm. um, advertising. So the, the procedural motion, if you look in paragraph A, it's about this application, the context of this application, not about our approach to um, the whole issue generally, which is going to come up in the scheme review. Um, so both the additional information that would come to Council on Thursday night relates to this application, not about the, the whole context of where we should or shouldn't have uh, mm. late night. But wouldn't the information garnished from this no, be, be part yeah. of a wider yeah. review? And, and also it would be good to, Kerry, correct me if I'm wrong, to have the... You know, obviously you're going to write a report and have staff, but it would be good to get feedback from our businesses in regard to the information that we're requesting. Would that be to get it and to get the community's feedback? Like, is this part? Is is that question really part of the wider mm. view? No, 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 no. That's something that we will need to do as part of a scheme review. So, okay, that, that, sorry, that that will come in relation to your amendment mm. and what we do. But this is about this application. Yeah, no, I understand. Yeah. Yeah. But it would so fall under. Yeah, yes. So, Kerry, could we add maybe um, the information that I asked before, just for data, what are the complaints, where it's coming from, which are the businesses um, that are 
that are causing um, complaints. Is that relevant in this um, procedural motion? I'm happy to have a go. Um, councillors may wish to add that in, but I was going to provide that anyway for you. But yeah. Just be good to have all the information. Okay, we've got a procedural motion for us. And Councillor Stockwell has spoken to it in an answer question. So. Yeah. Can I just ask one more question then, yeah. please? Yes. So, like, it, this might be a dumb question, but I'm just wondering if we make a decision on this application, then I feel like we're making that before we've done the broader community consultation and locking them into a condition before we've done the broader consultation. Is that correct? Um, firstly, there's no such thing as a dumb question. That's a good question. Um, it's it's a um, what we have before us at the moment, which has triggered the broader policy question, is an individual application. Um, it would be unfair to put the whole application on hold for this applicant mm -hmm. because that would take time and this applicant needs an answer so they can manage mm -hmm. their business. So we're going to have to make a decision on this application. Um, uh, what we then need to do is to go through a separate process that puts a broader policy question and it might be consistent with what we end up deciding on this application or it might be different. But that's the decision that council's going to have to make. But ultimately, um, we do have an application that we need to make a decision on. Can I add a further point to that? This is only a request for more information for Thursday night. It's not a decision on the application. But you will need to make a decision on the application. On Thursday mm -hmm. night, based, yeah. but potentially based on more information. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, councillors. Um, I mean, Councillor Stockwell has spoken to the procedural motion, asking for more information to help us inform our decision making on Thursday night. Councillor Elizabeth. I'll speak to it because uh, it directly relates to uh, the objection I had to the motion uh, to the amendment before us. Uh, it does request uh, some more information about different noise levels, uh, an understanding of what's uh, what has gone before us in recent similar conditions, and whether this is uh, in keeping with uh, conditions that uh, council has applied to. Um, dining type establishments in and around uh, the uh, similar area in recent times and in keeping with our planning plan. So I think it's, uh, it's again, there's no, there's no decision being made here. This is purely a request for more information so that we can be informed enough by Thursday night to see if we want to add conditions limiting noise uh, of, the, of the nature of which Councillor Stockwell was, uh, was trying to move in that amendment uh, to this application or not. Thank you, Councillor Jessica. The Councillor just speaks to the procedural motion, Tom. Well, it, it, um, the junction is, again, in a, in a change. We're, mm -hmm. we're talking about a new vision for the junction. There's big planning going along here. And what, if we make a decision to allow the outdoor music, then we're making a decision that sticks forever. And that we may we may end up in that situation saying, gee, we kind of, we kind of wish we didn't give them that that um, that outdoor music there because it doesn't fit in with the next version of the junction that we're, that we're working towards. It it seems to me that um, moving ahead prudently um, is important until we get the massive shared vision for where the junction is going, and we don't want to step too forward too too fast, but we do want to get behind the junction with where it's going. So. I'm wondering. There's there seems to be an overlap. We want to give the um, the applicant surety in what they're doing, but we also want to pull back and say that it doesn't overlap and and, and proceed further into what the, the the future of where we see it going. So we don't want to give to step too far. So that's where I'm seeing this. There, there's there's kind of two things happening. There's two gears mm -hmm. going. One is we want we want to give uh, the applicant surety and staying staying open, but the the outdoor music if we say yes you can have outdoor music amplified until midnight we may regret that decision f further so that's that's my feeling because it might might be an inconsistent where where we end up with the junction in in a year from now so um, i'm appreciating that that we're that we're really talking about this slowly and i'm not quite sure where where but it sounds like there's quite a bit of um discussion that's going to come on thursday night so is that that's yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm happy to approve this procedural motion. I think um, we have an obligation to make informed decision, which means um, getting as much information as we can and considering the wider and the entire community. Any other councillors wish to speak to the procedural motion? 
I'll speak in favour of it. Um, uh, when we were discussing the last amendment, there were many very good questions about what it actually means, what 75 dB means, is 85 more appropriate, 90 more appropriate, uh, where else have these similar conditions been, been um, applied? Um, and I'm, I'm, for one, would be very interested in having that information to help inform a better decision on Thursday night. Mm. Can, I, can I just add to that? Yes, I support the motion. I agree that we, uh, we want to get this right. Uh, we're in a transitional stage. Uh, we're projecting vision forward for the development of this precinct and we do want to get it right. So I think it's um, a great opportunity to get further information to inform our decision and um, support this business and the precinct moving forward. Just to close. Uh, only to think that yeah, I think it is what Councillor Wigner was saying. It's probably important that if we can come to an agreement as to what is the acceptable limits in this application, it probably does set at least a benchmark to, to work on. And I, for one, am very keen to see that outcome achieved, which is a vibrant streetscape with music. Um, it's just we need to make sure that we have the, the, the relevant provisions in there to make sure that it achieves that and achieves a vibrancy while not unduly affecting residents on the hill. So uh, I think there's a bit more information we may get there. Put the motion in favour. It's carried unanimously. Thank you. Uh, now we can indulge in a strict five minute break, councillors. You're not going to Richie's? <laughs>
Oh, bad again, so. <coughs> oh, right, yep. That's carefully. The snow comes around. Yep. We're all good, we're ready to go. Well, I don't know. We're right, Kath? Yeah, fun. Good. Okay. okay, welcome back, everybody. We've declared the meeting open again. Thank you for your patience. We're up to item two, which is the Memorandum of Understanding with the University of the Sunshine Coast, referred from the Services and Organisation Committee meeting. And uh, it's a report by the CEO. Any questions of the CEO, councillors? Well, I think we left it um, last uh, last Tuesday when we were asked just what, what what would the job entail? Like, what 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 is the councillor's um, role? Uh, on the panel, and would would it be logical that one that we split it up over each year? A new councillor comes in and takes the position. Yeah. So the um, there's a, what, under the proposed memorandum of understanding, there's a management committee uh, which consists of two people from the um, Measure Council end and two people from the um, University end. Um, the proposal is that one be the CEO himself um, and the other be a councillor. What that management committee is designed to do is to look at or building the relationships, um, looking at some opportunities that are out there, um, like uh, Professor Scott. So yeah, that's that's really what it's about. Um, and would rotation work? Absolutely, that wouldn't be an issue at all. Um, if you want to go down that way, that's no problem. With. We had a, an informal discussion. Can I bring that up, you guys? Where we we made a decision and outside of here yeah and was it um I, if, you, if you want to tell me what you're trying to achieve i can well, help you get to right yeah there. okay no, get, get to get it to there where we where we decided amongst ourselves that i, I i'm happy to go last in the third year because there's three more years of us in council and i think believe karen wanted to be first is that right well it was open to everyone to put their voice forward well, I, I was happy to say I'm happy to, I'm happy to yeah. go first. I know, I know there are a number of councillors who attend, which is great. Right. That's yeah. a lovely problem mm. to have that everyone mm. wants to, mm. to get on this one. And um, on Councillor Wigner's uh, suggestion, I'll go on the fourth year. <laughs> 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 um, so perhaps um, if I can assist with some potential wording then. Yeah. Um, so instead of paragraph C, we might um, change paragraph C to read as follows, Kat. Well, no one's moving. No, I'm just going to give them some wording to yeah. enable that to occur. So, um, have rotating council representation. On the management committee. On an annual basis. With the following councillors. Want to take that role in the close follow in this order, sorry, in this order, and then the councillors can put in whatever order you want there in terms of councillor one, two, three, three, four, or just list out three. Mm. So just put. I'm happy to go first. Councillor Karen Pinzell, mm. Councillor Mary Lawrence, and Councillor Tom Regner. Is it any time frames or a year, oh, isn't it? Is it uh, annual basis. Councillor Pinzell followed by Councillor Lawrence, and followed. Uh, Instead of a point, just, just list their names out. So it reads, reads, have rotating council representation on the management committee on an annual basis with the following councillors to undertake that role in this order. One, Councillor Pinzell, two, Councillor Lawrence, and three, Councillor Wigner. That works? Mm -hmm. Yep. We have a move to that. We move Councillor Stewart, seconded Councillor Jurisovic. Councillor Stewart. Uh, no, look, I think this is great. I think it, it's fantastic that all the count that these three councillors want to be involved. Um, and I thank Brett and um, Professor Helen Bartlett from the University of Sunshine Coast Vice Chancellor for their hard work in uh, this memorandum of, un of understanding. And I congratulate Councillors Finzel, Wagner, and Lawrence Durning 
on the appointment, I think they'll all make a terrific contribution. And I think there's a lot of um, information sharing, research gathering, and mm. we can really lean on each other in two great organisations. So I'm looking forward to seeing what evolves. Thank you. Thank you. Any other councillors wish to speak? Just to see that. My understanding that Councillor Shrewsbeck was going to move an amendment, but he's already seconded the. Uh, no. No, you're not going to move an amendment? No. Okay. So it was moved by Councillor Stewart and oh, seconded okay. by Councillor Felicity. Uh, Councillor Lawrence. Oh, I, I want to do the same. I want to congratulate Brett for. Um, I wasn't forgotten. Um, uh, congratulate Brett for oh. suggesting, um, mm. I think, the memorandum of understanding and both congratulate the CEO and Professor. Helen Bartlett. Um, to me, this is just a, a great way to bring policies, resources, projects together, and um, also for spreading risk. Um, and I'm confident that both the university and council are going to derive lots of um, opportunities um, from this association. I think uh, I'll move on. I've had a really good idea. idea. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot about it. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> I forgot my second one. What's your amendment, um, I, I'm just formulating my brilliant idea when Cathy scrolls down a little bit. Have you got a D? Yeah. And at a D, it says request the Chief Executive Officer to provide a report on council, to Council on an annual basis regarding progress and actions taken in respect of the memorandum of understanding with the university. And I might have a little slight addition to that. Re request that the Chief Executive Officer and the relevant council, <laughs> because see in there, they can report on what they thought they would happen in the year as well. Very good. Very good. We have a seconder for the amendment, please. Councillor Finzel, Councillor Stockwell. Speak to ah, yes, um, it's actually Councillor um, Jerusalem's idea, and I think it's a good one. No, oh, good job. May I, may, I, <laughs> may I commend the council on his excellent, <laughs> <laughs> his excellent amendment? <laughs> Right. Uh, anyone else wish to speak to the amendment? Mm. Yeah, I would Excellent. also like to um, acknowledge the work by Brett and um, the university, um, Helen Talking Bartlett, about for the. the oh, yeah, the oh, amendment. the amendment, no, sorry. Yes, so I think the, the amendment then um, will be beneficial. Uh, so we act as a conduit to bring back the information uh, to council, to the staff, and to the community about. Um, the information and um, ideas that we've gathered in that space, and I think it's a, a positive um, amendment to achieve um, and measure outcomes. Thank you, Councillor. Thank Angel. you. Other councillors wish to speak to the amendment. Councillor Wigman. So, procedural. So, this the amendment, are we the, then can we speak to the. Um, yes. The yes. Okay, I'll get it. Sorry, I'll get it. Okay. Yep, yep. Uh, get it. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Councillor Stockwell, you used to close? No. no. We'll put the amendment. Those in favour? It's carried unanimously. It now becomes part of the original motion. Councillor Whitney, you wish to speak to the original motion? Yep. To the motion, sorry. Yeah, I think this is really enormously important. I think that universities, we've seen a massive shakeup since the whole COVID situation. Uh, what, when I was at the University of the Sunshine Coast, uh, one of the... Uh, goals that they spoke of achieving was community output and reaching, mm. you know, not tearing down the walls of the silo, opening it up so there's a free flow of information. And in some ways, um, you know, research, is it research at all if, if it hasn't, doesn't have an impact or if it hasn't actually gone out to the community? Mm. And so I find that we, we can really run with this, I, I'm, ho I'm hoping, and, uh, and open up the NUSA community more to the USC and the sharing of information mm. because what a university was is probably not what they will be in the future. Mm. Yeah, the councillors wish to speak to the motion. Councillor Stockwell. I do so. I think it, um, it's since the, uh, since we're dealing with the council representation, I think it's a, it would be a good thing to have various perspectives. That, you know, we, we are very lucky to have a new suite of councillors who came in with very diverse interests and, and ways of living in the world. and. Dealing with such a large organisation as the university, it'll help perhaps you know focus the relationship on their interests a little bit in one year, and then maybe move on to the next. Um, so, for example, you know the biosphere, we're living the biosphere. There's so many opportunities for us to have ideas about what might be good postgraduate research topics that we could feed in that would help us, uh, you know, work out how to manage this place better. It may be that you know, in terms of small business creatives. 
in Councillor Finzel's that there might be opportunity there to work with the, the business and the, and the, the, the arts uh, the academics over there. And mm. for uh, Councillor Lawrence, and, um, it's got a fantastic um, sporting, um, uh, both uh, academic but also in terms of the institute there. So there's a range of different interests that could coalesce with Council and I think having the diverse representation from Council will always will be a good thing. Sure. I think the uh, CEO alluded to it in uh, the, the meeting last week. Uh, this isn't uh, an uncommon undertaking by councils to uh, to have memory and understanding with uh, organisations within their uh, within their um, uh, their areas, but uh, in particular with uh, universities. I think it's a great opportunity. Uh, we're already undertaking or have undertaken um, some uh, scientific uh, studies and utilised. Uh, Opportunities with the university. This just gives us a, a greater scope uh, to expand the opportunities that exist and to uh, to look at where uh, there may be areas of commonality between uh, uh, the university and the uh, council for uh, further research opportunities and, uh, and further mutual uh, um, information gathering that uh, are beneficial to uh, both our community and the university as a whole and uh, those that study there. Thank you. Councillor Stewart, just two points. Uh, no, I think it's all been said. So looking forward to what progresses and watch this space. Fantastic. Put the motion those in favour. That's carried unanimously. Now we'll move on to a report direct to the General Committee, which is a request to apply the superseded planning scheme on an application to reconfigure a lot, a lot and four lots at 11C Church Street, Pomona, and welcome Kerry Patrick and Connor, and just to clarify, Terry, for people who may be listening or watching at home, <coughs> this report is not about deciding an application <coughs> for a, a subdivision. It's about under which planning scheme the application will be assessed and, and whether or not the, the council accepts the request to have it assessed under the superseded planning scheme. The assessment is yes, yet to take place. Is that uh, correct? That is correct, that's correct. So it's about deciding which scheme that we assess it under, the 2006 scheme or the 2020. The applicant, once we've decided that, will then need to make their application under a new scheme. So it, it does not in any way approve the proposed subdivision, and that assessment still has to be made. Thank you. Question, question Jack? To clarify on from that, um, should this be successful, how long uh, after this uh, approval to operate on a superseded planning scheme, would the applicant have to lodge an application for subdivision? Yeah, so the applicant, if we were to agree to um, accept the, an application under the superseded scheme, they have six months to lodge that reconfiguring a lot application with council. Kerry, why has the applicant, oh, shouldn't ask why, um, what are the advantages or differences between making an application under a superseded planning scheme and under the NUSA Plan 2020? Um, well, the applicant submits that under the um, 2006 scheme, the biodiversity overlay does not apply, whereas the biodiversity overlay applies under the 2020 scheme. Um, they, the applicant also suggests that under the 2000 and 20 scheme, it's more restrictive around rear lots coming off an access easement, um, which we don't agree with the second part. We agree with the first one. Yes, the biodiversity does not apply under the 2006 scheme. It does apply under the 2020 scheme, but there are requirements under both schemes around rear lots. What if the landslide hazard overlay, Kerry? Can you tell me about that? Uh, that um, didn't apply under the 2006 scheme and now applies under the, the current scheme. Um, it's confined to certain parts of the site, um, uh, different levels of, of risk. Um, our assessment, a preliminary assessment, is that it would not have an impact on a reconfiguration. It would be dealt with at a time of development of dwellings or any future buildings on the site um, would be addressed through the provision of geotechnical reports and the like, which would include recommendations which development would need to comply with. Okay, so at the time of building, they'd have to comply with certain conditions imposed based on the landslide. There would, there would be a geotechnical report, which would include recommendations, which would they'd need to comply with those recommendations around stability. Okay. So just, yeah. just following on the mayor's question, that means the, the people who would live in those dwellings that are approved under the superseded planning scheme are no more at risk 
for having their approval under made on the superseded planning scheme than under the amendments scheme. That's correct. They yeah. were people building houses on these blocks eventually will have to comply with the 2020 scheme, which has requirements around. Mm -hmm. So that's that's quite significant. That's very significant for for those for that overlay. Then that they actually have to people building just to rest assured for people in the community that the buildings actually have to comply with the landslide overlay in the twenty twenty plan. Yeah, that will occur regardless of what we what decision we yeah. make today. Yeah. Um, but you know, I'd expect with this site that it's not a high risk site in terms of um, the hazard on the site. So just to clarify, does that shift the onus of um, compliance with the 2020 scheme to the uh, developer on each individual lot as opposed to the developer of the lot as a whole? Um, so just ask that question Yeah, again. no, I think I understand. So, yeah. Yeah. so, so what, what I'm understanding is that under the current overlay, for landscape and, and biodiversity, uh, as it's being assessed under the 2006 scheme, they don't apply, but under the 2020 scheme, they will apply once this has been subdivided under the superseded scheme, and that will apply to each of the new four allotments. That's right. By each individual developer on those allotments. That's right. Subdivision and then a development. Yeah. In some instances, the hazard may be quite significant, yeah. and we would actually look for geotechnical information around the subdivision before proceeding there. This site's fairly low; it'll be dealt with through the houses. So, in either in either circumstance, we still deal with the biodiversity overlay and uh, landslip um, overlays, um, regardless of which what, which um, scheme the land development is undertaken. Um, uh, yes, to an extent, but with the biodiversity overlay, that the decision making around that is really made at the time of the subdivision because okay. where you place the lots, the roads all impact on okay. potentially Fo the biodiversity overlay. So, following on from that, that, that then uh, makes me ask the question with regard to the two sentences raised on page nine of the report. Mm -hmm. It says the twenty planning scheme also seeks no development occurs within ten metres of a waterway and ten metres by the side of waterway is rehabilitated really compliance. Blah blah blah. The next the last sentence. However, preliminary view indicates the waterways in a deteriorated state contain sewerage infrastructure mm. and so may have limited impact on the number of lots available to be achieved. That is if, if it was under the new scheme, but under the old scheme that won't apply. So is there any under the old scheme, is there any um, opportunity for um, rehabilitation of the riparian area as a result of that sentence? Oh, um, in respect... Oh, do you yeah. mind? So oh, there's two different things yeah. we're talking here. Mm -hmm. So the biodiversity is mapped and that's shown on page 9. Mm -hmm. So you can see on the left hand side of the figure 6 that maps the, the biodiversity, the riparian area, mm -hmm. which is essentially um, contained within the proposed drainage reserve on the subdivision plan yep. next year. The, other, the issue that we're talking about with the sewer line is in lot four. So if you look at lot four... So it's only in one of the lots? Yeah. Not all... Yeah, yeah. So that's so the proposed easement around there, okay. There's a creek or a waterway or a drain there that runs along the northern boundary of lot four and that's also where the sewer is and that's quite constrained. So the suggestion in the report is that the, um, the biodiversity overlay um, would in that respect to that lot four would not have a great impact on the layout or number of lots they would Well that then, raises, that then raises a further question, how are lots five, six and seven going to connect to that sewerage and drainage easement? There's no easement shown on lots five, six and seven or are they intended to uh, connect via the easement for access and services that's at the front so of the So that detail will be sorted with the subdivision application. Okay. That this layout, um, there are some... It's only indicative. Yes. Yeah. It, well, that's what the applicants put forward. Yeah. We can see some changes that need to be made to this layout yeah. and that will be dealt with the next application. Again, that's what's clearly missing for me is where that all yeah. occurs, which is when okay, yeah. that, that comes before us. Okay. Councillor Stockwell. Yeah. Um, I'm going to take it from a principal's position in terms of the only reason we would... Uh, accept uh, application of the superseded scheme is we think there's an adverse planning change. So you've mentioned a couple. 
One is the concept of there being a difference in real lots with, from memory, the old scheme didn't have a number where the new scheme we set a maximum of two lots coming off an easement. Is that where we're looking at as being a key difference? The applicant suggests that. I think there's no real difference when it comes down to it in the scheme. So the new scheme certainly makes a statement about no real lots for medium residential. The old scheme, though, asks for lots to front a road. So oh, in medium residential as it, well? It's silent on zones. Okay. So there's sufficient um, statements in the old scheme for us to deal with the intent of that requirement, which is really about making sure there's street car parking available out the front uh, for over any overflow parking, I think. Okay. Um, then the other one which was raised is the 2006 scheme talks about, uh, we would rely on the Water Sensitive Urban Design Code to have some uh, work scenario. It includes things like it should be designed to have a natural chain, channel design, whereas at, that, at the moment the drainage reserve is quite degraded, has got lots of environmental weeds. Does the 2006 scheme allow us to adequately condition it to um, have partial revegetation and removal that's of weeds, or are we saying that's a key difference is that would be considered rehabilitation which the new scheme yeah. requires? So the 2006 scheme, um, it's our practice to require some removal of weeds and some rehabilitation, but the extent and level of rehabilitation would be higher under the new scheme okay. that we, the officers, would require. That was essentially the question I yeah. asked and earlier. Yes. Yeah, and so the, the, the part of the, that gully um, that's got the sewer line in, the reason it wouldn't make a big difference there is because it's got a sewer line, so you wouldn't want to be putting lots of vegetation mm. in, in a sewage issue. That's right. Yeah. That's, that's right, right. Yeah. Um, Other key differences we've mentioned, and Cathy, if you can bring up that table. Is it went from uh, one zone to another, and we can see there in this plan it's called semi-attached housing, which was a consistent use for a duplex and multiple dwelling where the site is not less than eighteen hundred square meters. Um, and in the new scheme, dual occupancy and multiple dwellings are allowed. If we just scroll down, I think to me that last row there suggests there's been, um, in terms of the actually the last box instead of in the subdivision state, uh, the frozen lots are not large enough for multiple dwellings under the old scheme. We're under the new scheme uh, for multiple dwellings through with a plot ratio of approximately 400 and one with a plot ratio of 620. Suggest, in fact, there's been a beneficial change to me. Is that when you look at the how what I would have thought that the developer would have, uh, the valuer would have looked at in terms of land values, is they would have said, well, the highest and best use out of this, or maybe the, the, the highest use, um, actually there's an enhancement. You, you don't agree? <laughs> no, officers don't necessarily agree. We're not convinced with that. Um, there are swings and roundabouts here. So yes, the new scheme uh, allows potentially more dwelling units to be placed on a property, um, but it's fairly restrictive. It's more restrictive in terms of the flora that they can achieve unless they do some more dwellings. So this table, which officers prepared for you, is based on the proposed number of lots. Mm -hmm. So for instance, in the semi-attached housing zone, if they changed it to three lots and they're all above the 1,800 square metres, you would yes, achieve so some multiple dwellings under it. <laughs> so um, So you think it's... I think it's, it's about the same, but obviously there'd be a lot more work to know exactly the answer. Um, the final one in terms of... The, is it the applicant's suggestion that lot 100 is a drainage reserve? Because in the new scheme, we've actually got the it coming out of a, 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 a part of the next door neighbour's block which has been zoned for environmental purposes. And whether a drainage reserve is the appropriate reserve, is that something that would differ if we went under the superseded scheme versus the new scheme? Um, the... If council felt strongly that this land was of such environmental value, we could ask for it as public open space under either scheme. Um, it doesn't identify as biodiversity, but if the values are there, council could ask for it. And that would be around connectivity with other properties and whether there was um, you know, worthwhile for council to take it on and own the land rather than have it in drainage reserve. So Obviously, drain having it in drainage reserve still offers a level of protection. So who would own the drainage reserve? That was still state. State. Yeah. Uh, ah. With the council as trustee for drainage. 
Yeah. Yeah, we can't, yeah, that's what I was going to say. We'd still be, ca- we'd still so be trustee it, it on the land. It had a different yeah. status. It mm. was drainage reserve, obviously, than public la- um, conservation land. Clarifying question, if I may finish. I've finished, yeah. With this application being assessed under the superseded planning scheme, the level of assessment is, um, if I read it correctly, impact assessment. Um, for the reconfig application is code accessible under both schemes. Okay. So, so up there is just a comparison of um, unit development. So a duplex under the 2006 scheme is code. Multiple dwellings would be impact under the 2006 scheme. Under the 2020 scheme, duplex and multiple dwellings are both code. Right, so that's what's allowable on the site. Yeah, that's what's allowable on the site. In terms of looking at whether there's been an upzoning or it's about the same, that's right. Okay, so but the level of assessment doesn't really come into play when you're looking potentially at compensation provisions. No, but I'm thinking in terms of um, people who may want to make submissions about their application. Yeah. That, that it's not impact. It's not going to be impact assessable. No. So if they make, they're free to make submissions. They can make submissions. Yeah. In terms of compensation, Kerry, um, what's the cost of not agreeing to the SPS request? Um, well, that, I guess that's unknown. So officers have indicated um, that we think there is some adverse change in the change between the planning scheme because of the level of rehabilitation required, mm-hmm. and that would need to be quantified. Um, but we, we don't have any idea what that would be. So the applicant would have to demonstrate there's been an adverse change in the planning scheme, there'd be land valuers involved, and ultimately it would go potentially to court, and that would determine the value. So to understand the real cost, we would then have to look at the ecological cost of approving under an SBS versus under the new use of plan. Has that been done? With evaluation costs. Yeah, with... So with yeah, yeah, perhaps so perhaps I can answer it this way. If Connor yeah. wants to give an estimate of the cost of potentially rehabilitating the property on both schemes, no? possibly yeah, possibly like um, the 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 drainage reserve lot one hundred um, under the current scheme would probably um, be above forty thousand. Um, under the previous scheme, I I reckon it'd be half of that. And then you've got ongoing maintenance costs um, after that as for well for, for at least for um, yeah one year maybe for the drainage reserve, three years for the um, the park if we got it dedicated as park. So rubbery figures, very rubbery mm-hmm. figures. Yeah. So just sorry, one more question, mm-hmm. Brian. So what if we don't approve this SPS request? Can the applicant then? super adverse changes compensation seems minimal it doesn't seem significant say 20 30 thousand but does what happens then is that the court will then allow under the planning environment course will, will then allow him to make his application under sps we can't go ahead with him uh, no not quite so no. so what would happen if we didn't agree to this request today um for them to seek compensation, they ultimately then have to make an application under the new scheme and have it refused or conditioned. And then they would need to make a claim to council around compensation, claiming the difference, you know, doing the exercise that Connor has just estimated and request that of council. Council will refuse it and ultimately they'd make an application to the court and the court would decide whether we had to pay compensation. And in that compensation, I imagine any costs, all those costs of having to undertake mm-hmm. those assessments would be included in that, Poten- or potentially included in that by the court's, uh, the court's judgment. Um, I don't know whether the cost of the application to court and the legal fees and the valuation is all con- um, included. I have to check for you on okay. that one, Joe. Thank you. So, and, oh, sorry. So, so just going back. So in terms of the half costs, the previous stage of this development the the other gully on the premises and it's largely just been revegetated with lamandra from what i saw this morning is that what you're suggesting would satisfy the wooded requirement for a natural channel design versus multi-layered vegetation which you'd expect or is there was that one because it was a lower order it was a less requirement i'm just trying to get my mind yeah what is the what is the twenty thousand dollars job and what's the forty thousand dollars job so i think of That's what? been our practice, certainly, mm-hmm. under the 2006 scheme, to have it um, 
rehabilitated to the standard that one is. Mm. So I understand uh, you're suggesting that the 2006 scheme requires a higher standard, but that's been our practice to require it. So. Okay, and just one question in, in my mind. Do you think under either scheme, mm. or under the two, you think under the 2006 scheme that four lots is an achievable yield? As maybe not exactly how they come, but four yacht lots is a reasonable yield from the side, or do you think they're going to have to lose a, a uh, We're not sure, but we think they may have to lose a lot under both schemes in order to achieve the access to each lot. So it's not That's likely required. that the new scheme would have a significant adverse effect in terms of lot yield? No. Mayor Stewart? So just, just to coming back to if we didn't approve it and they went to court and sought approval under the 2020 scheme, the one difference they would be they'd have to do is they would, or the, the major difference is about the riparian buffer and that they have to rehabilitate that. That would yeah. be their requirement. Yeah, the major difference is the level and extent of rehabilitation is higher under the 2020 scheme mm -hmm. than the 2006 scheme. So it would the 2020 scheme does mean an improved environmental outcome for the site. And in your opinion, does that make much of a difference in your in all of your experts' opinion? Well, um, I guess that's for council to decide. But uh, the the 2006 scheme has been operating for, for since 2006, and I think it has delivered reasonable environmental outcomes. I understand that residents in the area are not happy with the first stage of the development, mm. that they were expecting a higher level of environmental outcome for the site. But nevertheless, I think it's delivered a reasonable outcome to the environment. Just to clarify, what... So the drainage reserve measures between 27 and 40, 40 metres, as I can see, but the riparian buffer associated with that, how large is the riparian buffer and what's the area that would need to be rehabilitated? The riparian buffer is 20 metres wide. So 20 metres from the drainage reserve? No, from the centre line of the waterway, it's 10 metres either Which side. Which is the centre line of the drainage reserve? Uh, yeah. Okay. yeah. Generally, generally right. speaking, yes. Yeah. 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 But the, the drainage the reserve and the... So, so essentially within the drainage, the, the, the rehabilitation would occur essentially within the drainage right. reserve and they're partly onto the block. That's all right. Just trying to clarify what, what the riparian buffer constitutes and what, uh, what, what areas would need to be rehabilitated. Okay. Thank you. So the, just to clarify, the drainage reserve is generally reflective of the riparian buffer okay. area. Councillor, what would, yeah, what would be Karen? the difference uh, between the 2006 scheme and the 2020 with regards to the the length away from the development, the riparian buffer rehabilitation has to be? Is that 10 or 20? How does that differ? Well, there was no riparian buffer in the previous scheme. Um, it was a waterway and... Um, Conversations, kind of correct me if I'm wrong. I think it would generally be um, within the bank of the waterway yeah. that the works would be confined to, as opposed to an area extending beyond that. So, with the the overlay under the 2020 scheme, it brings it front and centre at the reconfig stage, whereas under the 2006 scheme, it sort of sits down in the operational work stage, where you have a look at the the codes and start, as soon as you start putting culverts in. But um, it raises the level of assessment up into the sort of higher order reconfig stage because you've got your overlay. Um, it's clearly shown that you need to do rehabilitation at this stage of the assessment. Yeah. Mm. But essentially yeah. under the new scheme, you'd have a 20 metre wide area that's rehabilitated. Under the old scheme, it would just be within the within the waterway, within the banks of the okay. okay, so where it protrudes beyond the waterway, up to a distance of twenty metres from the centre line, would be what they have to mm. rehabilitate. Which yeah, okay. Mm. Can I just bring some photos up of that culvert area of which you speak from the previous um, development that we've talked about today that the community is not happy with, especially around the rehabilitation. Um, if you scroll down, I think there's one there at the culvert. I hope there is. No, oh, okay, yeah, so back one. So, not where the kangaroos are. Okay, so see this area here? Yeah. That's like about, oh, I don't know, two metres, or it could be higher. I don't know, I didn't step under the block for the photos. So, this is what. Um, came to council in 2018 
under delegation. And the community at that time was not um, happy with the consultation process around that with regards to the fact that this is actually a corridor that comes through a creek that goes through the town. So Karen, is this a question you can actually Okay, so this, this is a question, okay. So I asked about the buffer for the rehab and you mentioned the colet. So this is the colet that currently sits there. Um, how are we going to mitigate flooding in the future when the neighbours that back onto here that lost three metres of their property when this was developed, are saying that flood water, heavy rainwater now comes down the street, past here, down to the creek, and there's not adequate drainage. It goes across the road. Um, they have sent reports into council to have this repaired. Um, I'm waiting to hear back from staff. The question how is how, is, how, yeah, is how are we going to mitigate? How are we going to mitigate that under which scheme? Because this doesn't look like it's given the desired outcomes in the community. Sounds That's like what they're making points. Oh, so, so we'll can get, you we'll, tell me we'll how out. it's going to be better under which scheme, we'll please? Thank you. And, and you're free to use the um, oh, pictures during yeah. your debate. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, in yeah. terms of the um, the neighbour and the loss of land, they actually had their boundary fence on the wrong side of the boundary <laughs> so in terms of the water running down the road um, there will be an extension of the Kerbin channel um, which will then direct it into the upstream side of the culvert which then will allow it to go onto Church Street we, we think that there's been silting up occurring in the um, um, riprap where it occurs now so that's a maintenance issue that then we need to get the developer out there to go and clean it out to, so that it allows for um, you know, proper flows going down there. In terms of the, um, the flood design, that's all been done through a, um, a qualified um, engineer, RPEQ, it's all been signed off on. So what we're seeing now is um, actually maintenance flooding rather than um, the development leading to increased um, um, flooding events. So, so who incurs the co the ongoing costs of maintenance mitigation so and the developer. flooding? Is that council mm -hmm. or no, flood? No, as Connor oh, has indicated, no. the developer is being asked to address this. This development is still on maintenance, yeah. um, and so it's for the developer to address. Mm -hmm. And how long ago was he asked to address that issue? Well, I've only just seen the report from May this um, yeah, the latest one, so I haven't gone further back than that. I think there was an occurrence in last year, um, around about this time last year. Or yeah, this year. So to clarify, okay. that's associated with the, the, the um, development of lots one, two and three? Yeah, yeah, it's um, the, the curb and channel on the frontage of that. You, previously, the, it just used to just flow off the street over the land, mm -hmm. but now that there's curb and channel, it's directing all the water down the road. At the bottom end of the curb and channel, it's silted up and causing it to cross the road rather than going into the culvert on the upstream side. Have you yeah. finished your questions? Because that raises a further question oh, well, for me. Yeah. Okay. Mm. So, yeah, so that raises a further question for me. If we've already got drainage issues mm. and water flow issues and flooding, as, as occurs in Pomona, um, further development, or sorry, sorry, sorry further um, um, increasing the, um, uh, the riparian area and, and further vegeta vegetative uh, um, plantings within that area, are they going to be counterintuitive to uh, to water flow and uh, and um, and drainage issues that already exist well you know well normally the modeling they call it the mannings the r squared it's 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 all modeled to allow for vegetated creeks and then you, you have your maximum modeling you know based on the whole creek being vegetated and your blockage factors in culverts and things like that and with the design with this um the end of that curb and channel is going to continue up if this does go ahead, it'll be um, fully curved and channeled all the way up to so the that's top fine, of the but within, within the But within the drainage easement itself, mm. being a state responsibility once it's been handed, handed through right. by the developer and that the council being the trustee, will we won't be responsible for maintaining that? We will be, yes, no. as with all um, drainage as reserves. With all drain, as yeah. with all drainage, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so any, uh, any, fall, comes to us. any fall within the drain becomes our responsibility. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Can I, just to clarify, um, in terms of flooding, um, part of the reason that you do wooses is to increase the catch of friction. So the more um, vegetation upstream of the catch will slow the water runoff going down. So, it's un so in this case, increased vegetation within the drainage reserve will reduce the peakiness 
of the hypergraph downstream. Is this a question or and a yet, and so No. The question is, however, in this location, it's unlikely to incre increase the localised flooding on these lots and surrounding lots. Is that what likely? You know, it's unlikely that putting more vegetation into the drainage reserve will increase the very localised flooding. Unlikely. Yeah. I've just got a question. If we, you said that if we projected it under this, and they'd come back, they'd have to go to court under the 2020 and make an application. No, no. Both, both stackers have to make an application under the 2020 scheme and so have it we refused. Yeah. So, okay, so we can then, so they can then make a further application under the 2020 scheme to us, which would then incur them having to rehabilitate their own period. That's right. So that's their first step. Yeah, that's their And then first if that's step. rejected, then, yeah. Um, um, but they might say, based on conditions, there's been an adverse change because there's a higher requirement and for rehabilitation yeah, and they seek those. So in a nutshell, is if if, yeah. um, if we said, no, you can't make an application under the superseded scheme, you have to come under the new scheme. If they come under the new scheme and they get a refusal, then they're going to have a compensation yeah. right because they would have had a right under the old. Or if they get an approval that has a uh, impact on the value of the land compared to what they would have got, it's the differential that the compensation we, claim will come from. The only figures we've got around that is what Connor suggested is potentially around the $20,000 mark. That's right. Yeah, that's right. And the... The difference in value of land um, as well. So, what they purchased the land for prior to the use of Plan 2020 and the value of the land post 2020, um, without the added cost of having to rebuild eight, the um, rehabilitate the riparian zone, would that impact? Uh, well, I'm thinking it impact on the actual property value as well? Well, that's what this all Other is all cost. about, is having a look at the differences between the two schemes and yep. the implications on development for the site based on those okay. schemes, and then so working out the cost of whether the there's a change in, the in land, land value. Yeah. And, and based and on land, land value, would it, be, land, would it yeah. not be reasonable that the land value has absolutely escalated? Mm. Yeah, no, it's, it's the land value is about immediately before, before the new scheme after. came in and immediately after. It's not about what it's worth now. Mm. Immediately after. Right. Oh, I was going to do the day after. We'd like to move a motion. Okay. Very similar to the staff recommendation with the word not agreed to the request. <laughs> 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 so that, that recommendation, our last line just put not agreed. And add, <laughs> so after Pomona and not agreed. And add a motion. Do you want a big capital letters and underline seven times? Or? And this and the council indicate a preference for the area identified as a drainage reserve to be a reserve reserve for environmental purposes. Environmental mm. purposes to link to other areas upstream. I'll second that. Seconded by Councillor Stewart. And that council indicated preference for the the area identified as a drainage reserve to be a reserve for environmental purposes to link to the upstream areas zoned for this purpose. Something like that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Zone for this purpose. May I ask a question to staff before? No, we've got, no, we've no, got no. a mover and a second. A second. We have a second. Sorry, we have yeah, a second. Right. Have so, a so, councillors, a little bit of history. The first stage of this development did raise a lot of community mm. concerns, and but it also raised concerns from the natural resource management groups of the local area, because while it is only an intermittent first order or second order stream. Uh, there are values downstream, uh, including vulnerable and threatened rocks that have been identified reasonably close to this site. Um, we have identified in the new scheme that the areas immediately up uh, uh, have been zoned for environment, environmental protection, conservation and management. Co environmental conservation and management. We've heard that the key difference is around rehabilitation. Um, my view is. Um, 
the level of risk associated with not meeting community's expectations as part of the development process mm. um, and the level of risk of an applicant going down a costly court battle to um, get compensation balances each other out. I believe that regardless of the eventual outcome is that the community and I think council would like to see this area rehabilitated. Yeah. Mm. And we're in a strong position to achieve that mm. under the new scheme. I think that um, we can look at the response in the 2020 scheme being very much uh, a response to the res concerns that were raised on this, the, the stage one of this site. There's a reason it's very specific. It's be and you know, as as was just identified, my my reading of the water sensitive urban design code as it, to me suggests a higher level when I talk about natural drain channels. But then I've got a, a natural bias that I've been working in rehabilitation for a long time, and so I look at what the other channel is. And yes, it uses native species, but it still is uh, something less than what a na natural channel to me. So if staff probably view that that doesn't get to a point where we're creating uh, within this waterway an ecosystem that supports the higher level objectives of the NUSA plan, then I think it's much safer to go down uh, this route. And I, I do thank staff for bringing this to council. They didn't have to. And I, I presume it's because they realised that it would be one that uh, councillors may have a view on. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, question. Um, mentioned there is uh, the level of connectivity to uh, upstream and downstream areas, but I don't read a lot of that in the report. And, um, Connor, perhaps, or somebody please allude to the uh, the opportunities for increased connectivity to uh, reserves above and below this uh, this particular block. Uh, yeah, um, upstream it um, connects basically up through to um, Karura um, mm. Mountain mm -hmm. and the, the catchment around there and it's largely vegetated upstream. Downstream, it flows through a series of um, people's backyards, which are in protective drainage easements, oh. and they're vegetated until it um, goes through past the IGA car park, and then goes is piped on the ground underneath the railway and comes out near Pages, and then drains to the north into the Six Mile Creek system near the um, showgrounds. So, do we believe that? Um, um Increased vegetation there, slowing down the thing, will actually uh, assist in flood mitigation downstream. Yeah, it has has that potential to um, yeah mitigate and detain detain um, peak flood waters on the site, and also through the design of the um, subdivision as well. So, figure two on page six and figure. Um, I can see that, but it only it, it gives five a, on gives page eight sort of indicates. Where it gives indicative uh, yeah. elements of uh, vegetation above, mm -hmm. not a lot below, and, and you, you really can't see the yeah. an so indication of where the stream, where, where the, uh, the the water course actually flows through. Yeah, there, certainly, so. it's more about upstream than below. Lost contour. Um, I have a question then. If we're talking about below stream, there's been recognised that there's um, in Karura Creek, there's a known population of giant barred free frogs and tusk frogs, which require protection, and we do support the that frog identification. We fund that and promotion of that group. Um, it is a, is this correct me if I'm wrong, it's a summer creek, it's mapped as flood prone on the flood overlay map. And is it suitable for lots in Church Street to be zoned medium density residential if not 100% of the lot is flood free? Good question. Do you want to ask head before? Uh, oh, yeah, okay. Um, is it, the question was around the frogs in Kurura Park. I was there with um, the people when we found the um, giant barred frogs mm -hmm. back in whenever, 2005. Or, um, this, this particular stream order enters um, downstream from where we found them, but it's to say, not to say that they won't be in here. Um, uh, so, but this. This particular lot doesn't have what we'd call suitable habitat because it doesn't have, um, it's not vegetated at the moment. It'd be great to get it vegetated and provide suitable habitat for the frogs. So would part of that rehab under the 2020 scheme help 
oh, yeah, enhance definitely. that suitable habitat. Definitely, definitely. Even if even the provision of bio basins and detention systems and yeah, would definitely do that. Um, as to the flooding, I'll. Uh, the flooding should be constrained, generally constrained to the uh, drainage reserve area. So the lots five, six, and seven mm-hmm. would be out of the flooding. Flood mapping, okay. then might be a little bit to the front of flood, uh, lot four. A bit to the front end, front of lot, lot four. four. So that's part of what we'll look at with the the application to subdivide the land as to whether the the lots are suitably located in relation to them. Okay. So would you say then that the 2020 scheme or the 2006 scheme best? suit the mitigation of flooding around lot four? No real difference, similar no real difference. around that. Thank you. And just to clarify, the applicant principally wanted to be have this assessed under the super sewer planning scheme because they perceived the conditions for rehabilitation of a lot and environmental considerations to be more onerous under the 2020 scheme. They put, uh, yeah. oh, that's correct. Um, they, put, they put forward a couple of reasons. And, were, and what, what were the others? Um, Was it principally the requirement for re- yeah. rehabilitation yeah principally because the new scheme requires you know it's, it's identified by the biodiversity the old scheme wasn't they also raised the issue of rear lots so the new scheme has a clear statement of no rear lots when they're zoned medium residential density um, it's our position though that the, the 2006 scheme also had a statement around requiring lots to have road frontage and that we can address the intent of that requirement so that's equal equal so principally it's around they, they perceived the requirements of the 2020 scheme to be more onerous in terms of environmental yeah. rehabilitation under yeah. principle. Just to clarify the word pri- um, um, road frontage, private road frontage or street road frontage, as in church street frontage? Uh, well, what's showing... Because what, what that that, they're, they're, they're creating, creating a... Public, public road frontage. So... That, that, that would be considered driveway access for the four allotments as opposed to public road access for the four allotments because it'd be, it wouldn't be um, under a, 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 um, a, a strata scheme or anything like that. So the road would have to be some sort of public road, would it not, to access the four lots? Mm. So, the, so the scheme, the 2020 scheme asks for no rear lots when it's medium residential density. Mm. 2006 scheme mm. asks for lots to have frontage to a public road, to road. So if the if the access row the access provision into a, to access the four allotments is created, does it not become does it, can it be a public road or is it is it a private road under some sort of a, a mutual scheme for the four properties to be responsible for? Yeah, at the moment they've proposed it as an easement, so it's over pub, over private land, so it's private. So it's a private easement, yeah. not that wouldn't wouldn't, yeah. wouldn't fall under the uh, the. Um, Clarification of public road. No, it's privately that, that, that was all I was trying to trying to differentiate. The other thing to clarify, I'd like to clarify this. Uh, there was a lot of discussion around what conditions are likely to be imposed when if this when this subdivision is approved. When it is assessed and a decision is made, is that report coming to council? Um, so uh, that would be good. <laughs> <laughs> because I heard the comments before that the last uh, subdivision was done under delegation. Yeah, they, so that the, the problems coming from that. So I'm talking about this process going forward is going to be. Uh, ideally, more. we would report it to a council meeting. Thank you. Um, can I just clarify? The matter is code accessible under the scheme. So if it's at risk of being deemed approved, if we go outside those timeframes, we officers would need to decide it by delegation. Mm. But ideally, we or would aim to report it back to council. Meeting, or to call a special council meeting. That'd be appropriate. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Cool. Sorry, Brian. You have a question. Oh, um, in terms of the question of Councillor Drusvik about the difference between a public road and a private easement with four or three lots coming off it, there's two reasons generally for that. One you mentioned is public road requirement is because we want to have uh, ability to provide on free car parking. If it's medium density, there could be a lot of overflow car parking. But isn't the other one generally, if it's a private easement, developers tend to, to build the infrastructure at a lower standard than is required for a public road? Uh, certainly the standard for public road is, is quite high compared to a private driveway. Um, but no, I don't think that's the reason for the scheme requirement. I think the intent is around um, pub, um, street car parking and pot- potentially also around amenity about the number of 
um, properties that are surrounding it because you've got you know high density on there um, so it raises the issue of privacy and amenity. Okay. Tom, um, if you go back and assess it under the 2006 scheme, would they lose the medium density zoning? No. No, it's zoned semi-attached housing under the 2006 scheme, so they lose Which it. has similar lines. Similar. Which similar is similar, lines. okay. I thought similar Brian's, Brian's table showed that and it didn't show much of a differentiation between. Yeah, no. there were some pluses and minuses. Yeah. Any other councillors wish to speak to the motion that's before us, please? Yeah, I'll speak, Joe. I'll speak to the motion. Um, look, I support what uh, Councillor Stockwell has put before us. I think there's, uh, um, I think there's much of a muchness. I think uh, even staff have uh, suggested it's, uh, um, it's sort of uh, pros and cons on both sides of this, and uh, um, with regard to uh, the, the, the rights and uh, and the compensations that are possibly here. Uh, from the purpose of a, a better outcome for the community, I see uh, the 2020 scheme offering uh, offering far greater uh, opportunities there, and I think uh, it's appropriate that it get assessed under the 2020 scheme. Thank you, John. Other councillors wish to speak to the motion? I'll speak to the motion. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Um, I asked the question before about the cost of not agreeing to the SPS request, and I'm happy to. Um, see that the motion actually reflects that ecological and environmental outcomes outweigh loss of land value. Um, so I'm happy to support the, the motion. Um, I want to just make a note that ecological cost of, um, of any decision that comes to council must be weighed against the financial cost. Um, we say that we're different by nature, and I think um, we must start making powerful statements about this, especially in our decision making. An ecosystem has the right to exist. So on this basis, I'm gonna support the recommendation that supports improved environmental outcomes, such as rehabilitating the riparian buffer. Councillor Stewart. Yeah, look, I, I support the motion of Council Stockwell. I think it's a good decision. It's a good decision for the community. There has been angst in the past. I think it's important to protect those environmental areas. Um, but I, and I think that you know the compensation when we look at it, the cold hard flat light of day um, isn't substantial. So I think it's certainly worth, um, in this instance, um, protecting uh, um, the ecosystems and also. Um, know looking at this from a community point of view as well so I'm happy to support the um, Council Stockwell's motion. Councillor Stewart. Anyone else? Councillor Fintel. Oh yeah yeah I support the motion um, based on the issues raised here today given the community um, desire to see the um, environmental um, significance of the area upheld and are prepared to support that um, I agree with the uh, increased rehabilitation opportunities that would be beneficial to the site uh, that will help contribute to mitigating um, issues around the waterway. Um, I think that on top of that also, which has been raised, is the heritage around that area, which we haven't debated or discussed. But I think it is worth noting that um, Church Street contains many of the... Um, you know, the older Queenslanders, and also we don't want to see the amenity of that area with the block type housing that you saw in the photographs um, encroaching on that. I mean, it backs onto the trail that we are, as a council, um, significantly um, promoting this tourism to come to this area. Pomona is identified as a heritage town. I mean, we've got to look after our heritage overlay as well, that our um, precincts are protected environmentally and our character and our history needs to be preserved. Um, so I'm happy to support the amendment based on um, the, the things, the motion. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Fenzel. Tom, did you? No, good. Just did a, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to support the motion. I feel very proud to be part of a, a council that's not, takes advice, really good advice about process and the pros and cons of assessing under a superseded planning scheme and the municipal planning scheme. But what we're really looking for is the best outcome on the site, which will be live on well beyond 
um, mm. what happens here today, and it'll have real impacts in that community um, for years to come. And so if we have the opportunity today to make a decision that results in better environmental outcomes for that community from here on, I think that's the leg sort of legacy we'd like to, to leave, as opposed to uh, not to undermine the value of risk-based assessments. They're very important. Um, I think this is we're doing what we ought to do in this case, not what we otherwise should do. So I'm I'm in favour of this motion wholeheartedly. Councillor Stockwell, do you wish to close? Yes, thanks, Councillors. Um, yeah, this one revolves around our interpretation in terms of what, why you would or wouldn't accept a superseded planning scheme, and I, I think it's a really good indication that if the reason um, the applicant wishes to go on a superseded scheme is to try and avoid some of the community expectations within the 2020 scheme, then we don't agree with it. Mm -hmm. And then that then looks at the process going into compensation. And, and, it, and it is, to, in my mind, you know, in terms of adverse effect on land values, I, I'm yet to be convinced. And I, I do that for a number of reasons. Firstly, experience of real estate is, instead of being a drainage reserve, it's a rehabilitated environment reserve. Mm. It's probably going to increase value. Yeah. And secondly is, we've talked about potentially accepting an easement. And while we've got a ballpark figure of $20,000 extra, uh, for rehabilitation, I'm going to put a ballpark in saying that's $20,000 cheaper than what we could require is to make that a road. So I think we don't want to either persecute or, or, or the developer, but I think from the community's perspective, the best outcome is what we'll achieve is by assessing it under the current scheme. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Put the motion. Those in favour? That's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Then it's complete. This item is the um, commercial high use permits tender assessment, page 13 of the general committee agenda. Mr. Chair, I'd like to uh, declare a declarable conflict of interest in this matter. Yes, Joe. Uh, I, Councillor Brisbane, can follow the meeting. I have a declarable conflict of interest in this matter. I have a long standing friendship with Fiona Tara, who is one of the owners of Tara's Enterprise, private limited, trading as Adventure Sports Kite Surf Australia, who are the selected tenderer for the kite surfing lessons high use permit. Fiona and I served on the Sunshine Beach High School PNC executive together for several years. Our sons are in the same year of high school and are friends. Our family have attended social gatherings, celebration with the TARS, their residents and local eateries over the years. Whilst we no longer share PNC committee roles and our contact is less frequent, we remain in contact principally through social media and, while our, and our sons retain their friendship. As a result of my conflict of interest, I'll leave the meeting room while the matter is considered and is open on. Thank you, Councillor Jurisdiction. Amelia. Um, so, thank you. Um, I counsel Lawrenson and form the meeting that I have a declarable conflict of interest in this matter as my children are both trained by the Noosa Surfing Academy who is listed as a tender applicant for one of the high use commercial permits. Although I have a declarable conflict of interest, I do not believe a reasonable person could have a perception of bias because I believe I do not have a close and personal relationship with Noosa Surfing Academy. Therefore, I will choose to remain in the meeting room. However, I will respect the decision of the meeting on whether I can remain and participate in the decision. Okay. I'll, I'll move Council the council. Council. <coughs> council stays in the room. Council second. second by Councillor Pindell. Do you wish to speak to it? No, I don't. No, no, look, it's, it's a very, I think, you know, it's thank you, Councillor Lawrenston, for, for making that declarable. Mm. Um, motion statement but I think that there's it's it's a long bow and I think if we you know we all have um, children and associations and relationships it's clearly not a close one so I think there's mm. absolutely no problem with Council Lawrence and staying in the room. Mm. Now the councillors wish to speak to this motion. Put it to the vote. Those in favour? Carried unanimously. Right. I clarify that I haven't got any conflict because I don't surf dance. <laughs> surf dance. So no ten thousand word declaration. <laughs> Um, questions for Clinton Dennis. I've got a couple. Of, look, it just came to when I was looking at the on pages nineteen and twenty. Um, so it was interesting to note that there was quite a few. So go right away. Made made an application for both. Say both um, areas. So cutting at beach access fourteen and beach access eleven. So did that happen? So that's so they. they 
and then you've shared it around a bit. Was there any particular reason why one sort of Beach Access 11 was better than Beach Access 14 or vice versa or in their applications? Um, well, the way it's panned out is that um, at Beach Access 14, mm. which is closer to the rock wall, um, Noosa Land of Surf, which is Merrick's business, mm -hmm. submitted the higher mm. um, quality submission. Yeah. Obviously, their track record, which um, you see there, is 95, was, was close to outstanding as far as their track record in that field goes. Um, uh, Go Right Aways was also very high. Um, so the way it panned out was that uh, Go Right Away was, was a little behind um, in its submission on this one, um, but it was the um, best submitter on the um, Access 14 site for which Noosa Land Surf didn't submit. It's possible, you know... So, sorry, so sorry, Beach, uh, sorry, Beach Access 14 was Noosa Land Surf, wasn't it? They've got 100%. I beg your pardon, Middle 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 Beach Access 11, yeah. I beg your pardon, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, thank you. I was just interested that they both applied and what was the differentiation for you? What we do say in the tender is that um, we don't award multiple, we wouldn't award multiple permits for the same activity. So yeah, um, in the event yeah. that Noosa Land of Surf trumped at yep. both sites, we'd, we'd have to give them a choice of yep. which site they prefer. Got it. Okay, thank you. So it's a, it's a, through the chair, it's a submission-based assessment, not a merit-based assessment. So yeah. it's a merit-based assessment and not a sharing around yeah. type mm. philosophy. Yeah. philosophy. Okay. Mm. Question? So, Chair, can I just mention, I, about 10 years ago, I had lessons with Christy um, Surf Dancer about 10 years ago. <laughs> I no, it just came to mind. Should I make that as a decoration? No. I, I would have thought that is so remote. Oh, thank um, you. Yeah. I yeah. just get terrified with conflict yeah, of interest. That, I'm, that is so remote, I don't think. Thank you very much. I just thought, oh my gosh, I've had place. lessons with. <laughs> and she's great. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I've, I've got just a couple of questions. Um, uh, there's Sometimes, a, 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 um, oh, sorry, how many new businesses um, have we s given permits to this time round, um, Dennis? Just the one this time round. Yep. Um, and from memory, the previous previous time we went out to tender, we had um, a changeover of two of the permittees. So uh, just one this time. Fantastic. And where there has been a change, is it the situation that the previous applicant did not apply? It, it, that is the case for that one this time, yeah. So uh, we'll have a new business at the um, Spit uh, refreshment there. Thank you. I just want to make just reference to the weighting for track record and past experience. That carries a 50% weighting. Can you explain the importance of that, um, Dennis, and why we put so much emphasis in that? Sure. Uh, we did talk about it in the debate prior to going out to tender that, that you know, that's a fairly strong weighting. Um, it does reward businesses that have shown a good track record of operating on our beach. But the flip side to that is that in the past we've had businesses that have sort of rested on their laurels and perhaps their heart wasn't in it as far as activities, their activity under the permits goes. So um, whilst it's... Um, a heavy or a strong weighting as far as track record goes, it still does go to the performance of incumbents as well and, and their enthusiasm and level of service for that business. So it does provide the opportunity to to address when, when businesses are, are perhaps resting on their laurels. And the increase in permit um, tenure from three to five years is also recognition of that capital investment um, and experience. Yes, it's it's acknowledging that running these businesses does involve a lot of capital investment in equipment and, and um, the like. And uh, so three years does come around fairly fairly fast for both the permittees and council to run a tender process. So um, I think all parties were keen to, to provide a bit more surety. 
Could yep. I add um, an advisory note to the motion, um, Chair? An advisory note or an an advi clause? Or yeah, an, an advisory amendment. note. Yeah. Um, I'd like to add an advisory note. Advise all new Learn to Surf, Beach Fire and Surf Dancing Permittees of the upcoming Noosa World Surf and Reserve Surfers Code of Conduct and the need for their businesses to align with the code once adopted. Okay. Are you moving the whole motion with that added? Yeah. yeah. Can we have a seconder, please? Thanks. Seconder, Councillor Sewell. Amelia. Oh, the advisory note um, is just to tie in with what's happening at the moment. Um, the Noosa World Surfing Reserve, the um, MSQ, Noosa Council, and the surfing community are, um, are developing what's called the Code of Conduct, and the idea is to promote safety and respect for other surfers. Um, it's come about due to complaints and near misses with surf crafts interacting with other surfers and swimmers. And given that Noose is a surfing destination, it's important that we protect the experience of surfing by creating safer and more inclusive surfing environment. And more importantly, that we bring back the spirit of Aloha. Um, the surf schools and beach high businesses play a really big role in this and they've got a responsibility to educate and inform their clients in surf etiquette and community expectation. This advisory note <coughs> just reflects that responsibility and role and um, one that I think they'll take on board um, open-heartedly. Mm. Yeah, I, I thank That's you Councillor job. Lawrenson. Um, I fully support this. Um, on my campaign, I raised this issue around code of conduct for surfers to align with the code of conduct for our trail users that's noted on entry to the trails throughout the Shire. So I'm happy to support this. I think it's a great um, idea moving forward, especially when we're moving towards respectful community and um, honouring one another in the spirit of the aloha. So thank you. Uh, Tom. Yeah, I, I, I support this as well. Um, it, many, many people these days start their surfing journey with the Learn to Surf class. And the earlier we um, alert them to a code mm -hmm. of conduct and to our history and to what the, the expectations out in the water for everything to move smoothly, the better. So, yeah, thank you yeah, for that. Thank you. Yeah. Mm. Right. Yeah, so more generally, I think it's good to see that this process has reaffirmed that our existing uh, high use commercial users have been performing well because they've all had that good experience and so um, these are you know we don't do a lot of uh, commercial activity in public space but these are uses that are integral to the beach experience I, I think in the 60s my favorite thing to do at the beach was hire the air mattress <laughs> what do you call it certain so that's it. Surf yeah. I used to go floating out the back and get my uncle to save me all the time. But they are, do add to experience, and and as the you know, the I think the addition of the the advice in regard to a code of conduct is good, and and, mm. and that concept that when you're being educated as a surfer, it's not just about how to nap up real quick like I do, um, don't. And <laughs> <laughs> It's about the etiquette. It's about the you know there is a culture of surfing, um, and that's part of the, the um, thing that we should be trying to encourage. And part of the World Surfing Reserve ethos, which is good. Oh, I have to be support. Mm. Look, um, go, go. Oh. oh, you have spoken. Yeah. Oh, to this one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. yeah. Look, I'd like to commend the staff for the process. Um, that's been streamlined over the last eight years. Um, and also commend them for um, actually reducing the number of commercial high use permits given out when the need is no longer there, as demonstrated with the kayak um, hire. Uh, there was no need for that for that um, business to be occupying very valuable public space. So the tender for that was removed, and I think that's that's great because it does reflect the value placed on public space, it's for the public, and we're very careful about what commercial activities are permitted to use um, public space, and it's limited to those businesses that they couldn't really get anywhere else. Learning to surf, 
beach hire equipment, there's some snacks, port, um, refreshment, beach massage, which is lovely, and surf dancing. Well, um, Amelia's demonstrated the value of that. <laughs> uh, and kite surfing lessons, so nothing's ever wasted. Uh, so I commend the staff on the process, and um, yeah, I wholeheartedly support the, the promotion as it is. Uh, wish to close. Um, I'd just like to add, um, I respect and want to note the Council's engagement of an independent probity advisor. Um, it's critical that the process of assessing tender applications, especially um, high commercial use permits, is equi equitable and that it's conducted with integrity. So thank you. I'll put the motion those in favour. That's unanimous. Thank you, Darius. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you guys. Right, welcome back, Councillor Drusley. I brought an ice cream from Frenzy in the house, is that it? Yes. Item five, <laughs> sir. <laughs> certified agreement negotiation <laughs> process. The end of a long journey, Mr. CEO. Yeah, we want to thank Frank for all his work and, and the team that was uh, involved in negotiations, particularly um, Kerry Pontini, um, Diana Connor, and Ash. Um, Sarah Ash. Um, as always, it's not easy to keep seven different unions. I think it was happy at all times. Um, it's a miracle. But mm. we got to a point, and obviously, it's still. Um, there's two ways two people tend to forget, particularly the unions sometimes. There's two parties to an agreement. There's the unions on one, but the council's on the other. So council have to agree to it. And then there's a process for staff to vote on this as well. So that process is coming up um, and there needs to be a successful staff vote. And then it goes off to the commission to get um, uh, certified through that process as well. Just wanted to clarify one point on page 31, if I may, Mr. CEO. Mm. The, pay incre the, the last statement on the pay, pay increases as follows, year one, 1.6% or $23, I'm assuming that's per week, because I think right. it's mentioned later on, it just didn't, that isn't yep. clear through yep. that, that in, in that point there, so each of those dollar amounts is a weekly payment. That's correct. Thank you. And what that does, you know, like, um, we didn't have a weekly amount in the last certified agreement, um, but this recognises that some of our lower paid staff probably need a higher increase, so... Mm -hmm. Um, that's what I've done with either or approach. What pleases me with that is that's exactly what I've suggested should be the, uh, the, the way of pay increases for all, all levels. Thank you. Um, Mr CEO, the, just the initial comment, the initial Smooth Council Certified Agreement 2018 yep. brought together the two Sunshine Coast Council Certified Agreements which continue to apply and then under risk and opportunities says the maintenance of a single agreement provides for some administrative improvements from a management perspective and supports a collective organisational culture not impeded by barriers between the indoor and outdoor staff. Can you talk a little bit about sure. that? Sure. Most councils in Queensland, um, particularly the medium-sized, smaller ones, would have multiple agreements, uh, and the big ones as well, actually, some of those, where you have one set of industrial relations commission, uh, sorry, industrial conditions for indoor staff and one for outdoor staff. Some of them even have more complexity than that. Brisbane, for example, had one for um, you know the bus drivers, mm -hmm. and they have different awards that, or sorry, different conditions that relate to different segments of their workforce. And that's what we inherited to the Sunshine Coast Regional Council in 2014. We they had two agreements, one between their indoor staff and one with their outdoor staff, and they still have that. Don't they? they still have that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So one of the things we tried to do in the last agreement was to say that they're one organisation, and that we should have mm -hmm. one set of conditions that apply to all staff, not have different conditions apply to mm -hmm. different parts of the organisation. So if you look, in the, in the previous agreement, that was the one big thing we got out of, mm. which was to have a one workforce type approach. And that's what we've stuck with this time. Um, a couple of times through this process that, you know, some of the unions wanted to go their own way a little bit, but essentially we, we said, no, we, we are one organisation, we need one certified agreement that applies to all of our staff yeah. to try and break down those barriers. Is that quite common? The two agreements. Um, it's becoming more so. Uh, it's trending across Queensland that more and more they're trying to split uh, the indoor and outdoor. Um, part of that is to do with there's more indoor workers than outdoor workers, so they feel that they'll just got caught up in the, 
uh, in the majority vote. But you know, again, what Brett said and what I've done in the past as well is always maintain that one one agreement because you know culturally that doesn't split the systems. Uh, mm -hmm. Everybody's under the same banner. Mm -hmm. These increases are they in uh, line with other organisations? Yeah, the. Um, it, it's not as uh, attractive as what it was in the past. Uh, what we did when we started this process, we mapped it out to our recovery journey. So um, the, the lower increase in the initial years are very consistent with a lot of other councils. They're actually quite lower than some councils, uh, a little bit higher than some, uh, but at the same time too, you'll never get a complete parity across across Queensland because everybody's negotiating at different times. Mm -hmm. Everybody's got different base rates. Uh, but what this did was cons kept consistent with our journey on our COVID recovery plan as well. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, just a question. Um, in the past, we've sought to negotiate some flexibilities within the agreement. So have any of those been lost in this process or any added? Nothing's been lost. Yeah. Um, what has been gained, and it probably uh, is something that we can build on the future, is a brand flexibility of ours. So uh, what COVID did in the last 12 months, flexible work arrangements and things like that uh, became uh, more the norm, more accepted, but also too, what we did need to acknowledge is that uh, our workforce is not what it used to be, it's difference, differences, and the six or six time frames which aren't always as um, uh, workable for some as others. You know, the good example was the single parent who, you know, would be happy to work a little bit more into the evening but doesn't want to get caught up in adjusting you know those standard span of hours because if they can go and pick up their little one from childcare, yeah. uh, that saves them a bit of money uh, they're happy to work into the evening just to make up that time and you know it's that flexibility that we've got into the agreement this time mind you that wasn't easy to get that uh, but mm. that's actually just you know planting the seed uh, and building those foundations for what is you know the, the way of working in the future okay, so the, the other thing that's probably changed in recent years is that to some extent, um, certified agreement trade-offs, which was going back to those, you know, the history enterprise bargaining agreement, which is where you traded off different things. Mm. A lot of that's still been done. There's not a lot left to trade off. Um, and a lot of the other councils have probably come to the same conclusion is that you try and do um, as much of reform, if I can use that term, through management prerogative or management policies out sitting outside the industrial relations instrument. Um, so that's been probably the other trend that's happened over the last five years or so, where you try and work out Okay, we want to get changes. Can we do it through a, a policy change? Um, and does it need to be in a certified agreement? Um, if you've got it in there, once you're in there, it's hard to change. You, you, you lose that flexibility. Mm. That's probably the other big thing. Mm. Uh, that's a good segue in for me around um, policy makers making policy around these issues. Um, workplace entitlements is one of the most effective methods for assisting employees to seek um, support. So we, I'm wondering have, uh, yes, in your process yeah. of um, reaching these improved leave management provisions as on page 32 of 46, which is my question. Um, how is the organisation taking into consideration that 55 to 70% of working females are estimated to have experienced or at risk of experienced domestic family violence in their lifetime? And it's critical for strong organisational competence around the understanding of this and a response to family and domestic violence and ensure that it's prioritised. Um, can you tell me a little bit about what um, first leave management prov provision and entitlements you've made in this um, process? And secondly, and it might be an answer to the CEO, um, how the, um, he's going to address the policy to um, recognise the um, protection and rights of women in its workplace who may be subjected to violence. So thank you for that question. Uh, in the previous certified agreement, uh, we do had domestic and family violence leave provisions. Uh, so they've been maintained for that. That provides a minimum of 10 days uh, leave. And so that was brought in in the last agreement. Yeah. It wasn't there previously, it was 2018. Mm -hmm. yes, yeah, we brought that in for the first time and unions were happy with that. Mm, yeah. okay. um, so those, those things have been maintained. Uh, on the back of that, uh, Council has a domestic and family violence uh, workplace strategy from which um, the development of a policy and training for staff were the next steps. The policy hasn't been developed yet, uh, but at the same time too, that's actually um, uh, part of our plan rolling forward because the, the policy was done pre-COVID. We're actually now revisiting a few things and just reviewing to see if they're up to date and they're current. 
Uh, we've got a meeting with the training provider next week. Uh, we were to do training last year, but yep. obviously a lot of COVID. things went, didn't go to plan last <laughs> yeah. year. Yeah. Uh, so that's that's those next steps. I think the other thing is too, is that looking at, you know, what the, what a, the current workplace looks like, you know, we talk about flexible work mm. uh, and things mm. like that. Uh, the evolution of flexible work as just one example. Um, whilst we can have leave provisions and that, we've got to take into consideration, you know, um, safe work environments, yeah. not just only here, but at home as well. So, mm. you know, the domestic violence uh, isn't a narrow focus mm -hmm. for us. It's not a narrow focus for society, but, you know, if we're going to get into uh, supporting our staff, we need to consider uh, that it's a broad mm -hmm. range of things. So we've got good provisions there. They're well above, yeah. if you look at the Fair Work Act provisions, there's just one yeah. benchmark. They're, they're well above that at five days, uh, hours at 10. Uh, we've got a strategy oh, it's time to review the strategy uh, and we'll develop a policy uh, and revisit our training and you know, that's training for staff but also for managers as well yeah we did training i'm thinking about two years ago which is just the best training i've ever been yep. yeah oh that's been, fantastic so, um, and, yeah, we couldn't get it last year but we'll get that going again as well so. mm. just yeah. a follow-up follow question really strong follow yeah, on question thank you from karen so you mentioned the domestic violence strategy but then you're going to formulate a policy how What's the difference between the two, and, to your way of thinking, what will they do? Yes, a strategy is a better approach, so it encompasses a number of different things. It's, you know, it's your training, it's your policy development, all those things. Uh, your policy is more your position, so whilst they're in the certified agreement, it might detail certain things. A lot of that would carry into the policy because they've been certified. Uh, but there may be actually other provisions uh, that we want to, to include in the policy model. So include things like, you know, here, how very often we have managers do the training, who we get to do the training. It's more what our position. More prescriptive, yeah. yeah. And you don't want that level of detail in the certified agreement because it's, it binds you down. So you want to have that flexibility. Yeah. Just mm. okay, which, which one you put in which document? Yeah. The other yeah. question I... Sorry, can oh, you, yeah. you yeah. were on a I was just going to ask about um, any of this process um, it, it's been proven it's essential and reliable and workplaces are, are being recognised as a good data collection um, centre to help you know address these social issues. Um, this disaggregated data, it's critical to effectively measure progress in achieving gender equality to ensure women and children are safe. How is this organisation or have you got any plan around improvement and continuous improvement delivery? planning to capture data that could feed into the broader um, you know pool of mm. you know society when we're trying to address this violence against women um that 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 can be picked up in our review um, that'll be picked up in yeah your we'll review. pick that up in our review because i think it, it, it's small steps in this space i mean it is it a societal is, yeah. issue but yes, it's it also too about breaking down barriers you know we've got to provide an environment where people feel comfortable about yeah. firstly having the conversation, but also mm -hmm. too that reciprocated conversation back. Um, you know, I don't know a lot of people that would automatically put their hands up, but at the mm -hmm. same time too, if we can build that capability, mm -hmm. because it is a capability into our workforce, you know, managers and colleagues, <coughs> yeah. they can see the signs, they know how to approach the conversations. Um, yeah. That's those that's those initial steps, and you know, then um, we can look at the measures of success for this uh, as part of an ongoing review cycle for me. Yeah, that sounds great. And when's when's that review anticipated for? Uh, it's part of my branch plan for uh, next next year. Oh, fantastic! Um, yeah, we we have had tried to get a few things off the ground this year, but uh, one of the big challenges is the training. Uh, it's a very stop start in the training space every time you do go and commit the it's more so the providers aren't able to. So we found somebody okay. that we'd like to engage a conversation with and just see where it goes to from there. Mm. Yeah. But it's on the. Uh, on the to-do list council. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. I'm, I'm really pleased to hear there's been such, a, mm. you know, attention given to this detail through this process and projecting the vision forward to help, um, you know, support and mitigate violence yeah. against women in the workplace. So thank you. Yeah, yeah sorry, further question to my, uh, the pay increases, particularly with the dollar amount. How does that apply to casual staff? I mean, I'm sort of assuming that the, the minimum dollar amount applies to full-time employees. How does it no, apply? It's, it's all staff. So, so $23 what? regardless of how many hours they work? It's a it's proportioned back right. against their their hourly rate. Back against yeah, the hourly yeah, rate. Yeah, okay. yeah. So that's, that's, that's um, what I was expecting. Yeah. To... We don't exclude anybody from it. We have three streams under our collective. So if someone works fifty percent of a full time. They get fifty percent of that amount. That's yeah. that's what I expected. Yep. Yeah. By, by the way, nice to nice to have you uh, at the table, Brent. I don't Thank think you. First time, first time at the table. 
are not with yourselves, yes. No, uh, but we did all council, the, council meeting. Yeah, thank oh. you, council. We did all the uh, negotiations in this room, so it's much more pleasant, <laughs> uh, I would say. For that reason, <laughs> <laughs> there is, there is a... Wait, can I ask a question? Can I ask a question? It's yep. something that I've been asking Brett about but now I'd love to hear it from the horse's mouth. Um, <laughs> sure. Notice of disclosures. Um, it's something that I would, would have loved to have seen in the certified agreement, and that's in regards to anyone that's got any outstanding um, DV, whether it's breached or not, if someone's got an ABO or someone's done anything that will bring the, mm. um, will bring continuous the council, yeah. continuous disclosure yeah. on ongoing staff, but anything that'll bring renders a person unfit or improper and brings the the council into disrepute. Um, I would have loved to have seen a notice of disclosure where they have an, have an obligation to have disclosed, um, for instance, that they have been issued an AB, mm -hmm. whether it's breached or mm -hmm. not, and then the then I would have loved to have seen a requirement that they've undertaken some type of behavioural change mm. to identify that as an issue yep. um, and that we're satisfied with that training. Um, why was that not included in the certified agreement? Um, very simply, Council, that was something we probably wouldn't want to get into the certified agreement because then that locks us into the future um, and it may uh, cost us in the future to change that. We can do that through policy. Mm. Uh, when you put things in a certified agreement, you're pretty much bound and then you have to negotiate your way out of them. Whereas if we put into a policy, we can actually set a set the position for ourselves, have an organisational policy without having to go through a whole engagement process okay. industrially. Um, it's, a, it's a really good question and it's uh, something that I've started to look in. Part of my history was doing um, working in organisations where we had criminal history checks. Yes. Uh, and I worked through the advent of blue cards and all those changes. Oh, that's great. Um, there's two things that I've been asked to look at. Uh, one is is about what sort of criminal history checks we can we can do on people. Uh, firstly, what I would say is that needs to be relevant to the role. You can't do checks on people uh, and things that they in their history that isn't relevant to their work. Mm. Uh, a bit of a legal minefield. The second thing is is that uh, is what sort of disclosure about their past where it may not be relevant, but if it's in you know relevant to the the context of the conversation here, where do we stand on those things? Mm. Um, it's an interesting one. I think given, that. Uh, yeah. Can I, can I interrupt? Yep. But given now that the workplace we've, we've identified that people are working from home. Yep. Um, I would staff think. Are, not all staff work from home. Not all staff work from home. The outdoor workforce, for example, so we yep. have the same rules. We have to work yeah. out. It's a bit hard to pave a road from the backyard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But what happens outside of home impacts your ability to perform your, due, your, yep. your um, job. Yep. So yep. I, I understand that, but and I'm also excited that there's still opportunity to introduce a notice of disclosure, um, but it in policy um, statement as opposed to a certified agreement. If we do it in policy, then we can change with legislation, change mm, with okay, our position. We can we can flexible. ramp it up. We, it's absolutely, yeah, which it's more flexible. Yeah. Which, yeah. And agility, you can yeah. move. Yeah, we've got in a certified out. agreement. We are mm. locked in for a couple of years mm. and can't go back to it. And uh, mm. if we start wanting to negotiate around mm. the terms of that. Those people who have been involved in the process usually know that uh, it will come at a cost. Mm. If we put a policy in place, um, it can change in six months, it can yeah. change in 12 months. Uh, it gives us flexibility at the end of the day. Thank you very mm. much. Mm. Joe, there's probably a little aside that just sort of uh, tangents off uh, the question of uh, criminal history checks. Uh, a recent um, court ruling that you can't discriminate based on criminal history now with regard to employment. Is that something we're aware of? There's something we'll do our research on to make sure we've got a very clear position. Yeah, I was uh, very interested to read that. I thought it was, a, it was an interesting standpoint that the court had taken. Yeah, thank you, Council. I mean, I, I go back 20 years when I was doing criminal history checks and, you know, it's relevant to the job. Uh, it's contextual for how far back. It, it's just not a, a straight line on and any decision. And whether decisions. it's inherent in, an inherent requirement of the, of the job. Absolutely. So it's got to be relevant to yeah. the decision. Yeah. Are you aware of that court decision or is that... I'll, I'll flag it and try and, try and find it. Yeah, I'd, I'd be very interested. There's a lot of decisions in the industrial relations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, one, yeah. That, that, that one, yeah. a stout thing. Yeah. Yeah. The council's care to move the recommendation. I'll move. Move council jurisdiction, second with council Stewart. Joe. Uh, clearly an important uh, element of uh, council obligation to its staff to get this right. Um, for me, one of the pleasing things is to see uh, a minimum dollar amount, um, uh, particularly for those lower paid workers. Um, 
whenever you work negotiate on percentages alone, someone on $100,000 getting a 2% pay increase gets $2,000, someone on $50,000 gets $1,000. The divide continues to grow. So uh, ensuring that that divide um, is, is managed and maintained and people on uh, lower wages aren't, uh, aren't left behind is an, an important aspect of it. So very, very pleased to uh, see that starting to creep into employment agreement decisions. But again, um, good to see that we've managed to, for the second time in my term here, uh, negotiate an outcome that uh, benefits all staff and that uh, everybody, including all the unions, can agree on uh, going forward. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Any other councillors wish to speak? Uh, yeah, I'd like to just thank Brent and um, the CEO and all the staff that have been involved. I know the process, uh, it's, <laughs> it's long and challenging. And I'd also like to acknowledge the staff in this space because, you know, um, if you've had people voted to represent their, their staff, they also take on that arduous role of, um, you know, representing their peers yeah. through this process. So, um, yeah, I just want to say thank you to everyone involved that we've uh, reached a hopefully equitable outcome, that we've got room in, um, you know, with policy and things around that, that we can um, address things that we've identified today. Um, and I'm pleased to see that the Noosa Shire Council is um, working towards addressing um, there's pressing social issues of domestic and family violence uh, with the recent groundswell of attention um, from policymakers, the media and the general population. Um, I'm pleased to hear back from you, Brett, today that um, you sound more than capable in this role to drive us forward as an organisation that can um, be really active in this space in providing, you know, safety, um, support, and um, data back to the wider um, hmm. question around how we address this societal issue. And it also segues into the, uh, you know, the memorandum with the university because, you know, they are also in that space collecting data around these, um, these issues. So um, I think the council is being very um, progressive and I wanna congratulate everyone that's contributed to that in some way. So thank you. Yeah, I'd like, thank you. I'd like, I'd like, would like to thank Brent, Brent and Brett and the staff involved in um, these negotiations. I counted eight unions, so to get them all to agree is no easy feat. So, mm -hmm. and it's also, as Councillor Drusevich said, um, really pleasing to see that um, our lower paid workers are getting an increase. That's really important, um, especially with the financial pressures that COVID is placing on many of our families, and obviously with affordable housing being. In the crisis that it is, um, it's, it's great to see that you know we have negotiated that and acknowledge um, how important they are to our um, council. Thank you. Right, uh, Jody, Mr. Close. Only to uh, uh, you um, reiterate the, uh, the the thanks that uh, we give to uh, staff, CEO, uh, Brent, and uh, and everybody involved in the process in. Uh, the smooth process that this is uh, this has been uh, once again, and uh, the negotiated outcomes that have come that uh, everybody can uh, can benefit from. So thank you. Thank you. Put the motion all in favour. It's you. unanimous. Well done, Brent. Thank yeah, you. thanks, yeah. Brent. Thank you, Brent. Yeah. The agreement did assign Santa Claus responsibility, so I presume. No. <laughs> <laughs> No, Thank you very much. That, that, that falls to Brent, he doesn't realise that yet. But you should have been Sitting on the small. Through the chair, I need Yes, you're excused. Um, item 6 Financial Performance Report for April. Welcome, Michael Shave, Director of Corporate Services. Questions for Michael? Uh, no. I'll start page 34, oh, okay. Michael. Um, just something that stood out to me, local laws infringement revenue, $82,000 above year-to-date budget. Um, that's probably great from a accounting point of view. As a councillor, I think, oh my God, that's not a great thing. Um, where do those, do you have the information, do those fines come out of dog parking, parking? Um, why such an increase? I think you've got to go back to the budget. It was a conservative revenue budget due to COVID. Okay. So it's not Noosa, necessarily. There's above, been no absolutely. basically no COVID in Noosa, so it's been business as usual for months. Hence, our regulation around parking has 
pretty much gone back to normal levels early on. So um, revenues above those conservative forecasts. Based on the conservative forecast, correct? It's no above and beyond our normal level of compliance. Okay. And you might recall that during COVID last year, there were virtually no parking fines being issued for a couple of months. So now we're back on right. the normal cycle of things. Any concerns that you've got? Anything keeping you awake? As Brett always asks. In terms of the operating budget, um, I think no, we everything's tracking well. We're slightly under with our expenditure per the ZEC summary. You can see everything's green. Probably the capital expenditure wise, I think we need a good run of weather. We've got a lot of work to do in the next probably six weeks yeah. to make sure we, um, we get plenty of cash spent and the works on the ground, you know, finished or, or even commenced. So there's, um, you know, we need a good run of weather because we've had a bit of a some hiccups over the last month or two, so yeah, that's we've ordered some. We've ordered the sun. It's out today, so it's good. It's all good. <laughs> um, a question Brian and then Joe. Yeah. In fees and charges, at this building application fees is up, but we've been advised that there's also a spike in planning applications, but they're not listed. Is that because we preempted that there would be a spike in? planning applications around this time because of the change in scheme? Or? Yeah, and possibly we, um, in terms of BR3, we took up that spike. Okay. And we took up some in building and plumbing, um, some year-to-date spike, but theirs is probably still still trending, mm. trending a bit higher. But talking to actually one of their guys this morning, they're, they're, it's very, very busy. And they're, um, yeah, they're Try and just keep up with demand at the moment around the, the application. So home, homeowners grant stimulus, I think, has really got yeah. onto the ground and people are just spending up on their building stuff. So it's huge. Sure. Yeah, Michael, um, one that uh, caught my eye was commercial lease revenue 148k above year to date budget. Seeing as holiday parks are mentioned elsewhere mm -hmm. and um, Sunrise Shops has been at a major vacancy there for some time, where are we getting our? Is that just the, the conservative budgeting and we didn't expect the, uh, the um, return from COVID as soon as it is, that the, is the result of that? Yeah, there's a combination there, Joe. Um, ferry revenue has definitely well above forecast. We were very conservative with ferry revenue given, you know, when we put the budget together, it was a, a COVID budget and we thought we'd have longer periods of lockdown and so on. Okay. And <clears throat> similarly with the Sunrise Shops, we allowed some provision for some rent relief mm -hmm. uh, based on economic circumstances. Again, things have been gone well. The shops have been, you know, those tenants have been earning income. They haven't met those 30% thresholds in terms of income reduction to trigger those Commonwealth Okay, so, we've, measures, so, we've so, had, there so the better some, outcomes have been... Yes, so okay, a combination, but... I, I assume that, but I thought I'd double-check that that was in. Um, the next one I've got is natural areas costs 52k above year-to-date budget, 60% or 795 of the 1.3 million spent. 60% at this point in time, we're 75% of the way through the year at the end of April. Um, I would have expected that would be close to the 75% of the spend, or are we expecting a big spend in the last three months with natural areas? Yeah, without digging down into that area, Joe, I'm not sure. Um, just but sort, of I'm seems, just sort of seems out of sync, there, that's all. Yeah, it could be a budgeting timing issue rather than anything else, but yeah, it appears that they've got a bit of spending to do in the next month or so. Can be able to clarify that, that if that's the case? Yeah, sure. That'd be great. Thank you, Ron. Joe. My recollection also was they jumped in and did a bit of um, proactive uh, tree work uh, ahead of time as well. Um, yeah, we dealt with that at BR3. Yeah, but being, BR3, yeah. Yeah. My, my thing being 52k above year to date budget, yeah. they've only spent 60% of their yeah. budget. I would have expected that would have been 70, above 75% of this year if it's a linear factor, but if it's a, you know, there's a, there's a major project to be complete in those last three months, I'd expect a surge there. So I just the check. Two, I'll check that. Yeah, I'll just the imbalance between being above budget, budget and being under 75%. So. I'll just jump in there if I can, Joe. Yeah, please, that's yeah. it for me. Um, okay. On the statement of financial position, Michael, on page 43, can you help me understand the, the provisions line item? We finished 2020 with a provisions line item of 4.6 million. We're currently at 2.5, but we're projecting to finish provisions of 7.5 million by the end of this financial year 2021. Why the increase? from last year, what are we setting aside money for there? 
Your, your cha- that it change. That change would be around our landfill provision. Um, we've got some significant remediation works to do over the next few years with our cell capping. So if we, you know, basically what happens is you fill your cell, have to remediate, put the layer of clay and cap it, and then you move on to the next cell, which um, you'll see in our 10 year capital program, there's some significant forward budgeting allowed for the cells. So this is obviously providing for that. And under the accounting standards, you've got to provide for the capping or the cost of capping and yeah. remediating. We've uh, also been undertaking more capping and, uh, and greater greater ceiling to try and capture more methane. And, uh, and all the rest yeah, so that's predominantly that movement in that. So it's not a put aside on a pro rata basis, but we're at 2.5 million at the moment. So that by the end of this financial, it seems like a huge jump to get to that by the end of 2020. Yeah, it's probably just more of an accounting. Yeah, you know, pro it will, movement it's type not issue. Linear. However, it's yeah. no, okay. it's, um, it will be that. It will be because you need to set aside that amount of money. Okay, correct. Uh, the other thing that affects the equ- bottom line positively, the equity in a positive sense, is the asset revaluation surplus, which has jumped up to 100 and, 103 million. What does that actually mean? The asset revaluation surplus. What's the process by which that figure is arrived at, and what's its implications? So effectively, that is um, allowing for inflation on our asset base. So each year is part of our revaluation. So under the accounting standards, every five years you have to revalue your assets so that the value you're holding represents the cost of replacing those assets. Um, otherwise, you could it's called cost versus current value. Um, but um, for instance, if you bought a building now and you didn't, and in twenty years' time you couldn't. Was fifty thousand. You can't say it's fifty thousand in twenty years' time. It's actually it it inflates in value based on CPI CPI and so on. So that's in the accounting standards. At each movement, each year in that, you recognise in your reserve value revaluation reserve. So and it's been about seventeen million down. Um, It's based on on a year to date. No, so that will be on a full year basis. It'll be increasing from eighty six million to one hundred and three. But that's that's allowing for also that significant capital work we're doing over the last few years. So our asset base is growing. Yeah. So when you allow that extra inflation on that bigger base, it's a bigger number. Yeah. Yeah. Given that that fact that the, 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 I'm just looking at the figures now, 86,525 at the end of 2020 and 86,525 currently year to date of 2021, does that mean we actually haven't undertaken the work that it happens in the last three months, or it does. It's as yeah. part of your end of financial year yeah. process, yeah. like at the moment, Trent That's and the team. When I, when I saw the figure had changed, I assume value was yeah. they're going through a valuation process of our, yeah. I think, waste and our other yeah. parks infrastructure, and then that'll flow through. So it's an indicative figure from last year put in there until the process. It is. It's a nominal figure. Yeah. 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 And for those councillors who aren't on the audit committee, there's a rolling program of doing yeah. different categories of valuations each year, different asset classes. So we just work through that over, over the years. But we also, for budgeting purposes, allow an inflation so that we're not <coughs> under depreciating our assets over in between those actual revaluations. So that helps smooth out our rates pricing decisions. So. And why has there been a significant drop in the current liability of trade and other payables from last year? We're we're paying we're we're paying paying. Current liabilities, trade and other payables. Page 43. Yep, Statement gotcha. financial. Position. Are we paying quick? Look, it, it, it's it's that's a year in year out proposition. It depends on what at the end of thirty June each year, what how much creditors you have to pay that you mm. haven't paid, and that. I mean, it's good. Yeah, and look, that could be ten million. It could be five million. It just depends on the cycle. But I would expect, you know, it's a nominal figure, the six and a half. Um, however, I think you would be looking at probably. That nine to ten million. Oh, so that's the estimate. pushing through the capital works mm. program, you're going to have a lot of bills coming in around about June because yeah. we're trying to yeah. get them in. We're actually asking to put them in, so it's likely to be higher. Yeah, but pre, yeah. as part of the COVID um, uh, process, we started paying on a more frequent basis, didn't we? We, we yeah, brought that, uh, that, that, that uh, rather than 60 day cycle, 90 day cycle, 60 day cycle down to 30 day cycle. I'd expect so that to be down to, 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 to reduce, which is why we're seeing that lower value there at six. But of course, yeah. That end of financial year will be the lag between what we've got waiting to be paid and waiting for those invoices to come in to pay those. Obviously, yes, that's correct. Interestingly enough, we, you know, 
Sometimes we have to chase our suppliers to get mm. the invoices, <laughs> yeah. which is yeah. surprising because you know cash is king. But but we yeah. um, we're onto them. And again, you've probably told me before, Michael, but what under current liabilities, what classifies as other? Because it's you've got four point seven million dollars of others. That's a lot of other. Yeah. Oh look, you probably put me on the spot. Mm -hmm. I need to. I'm, sh I'm sure if you gave me ten minutes, I could remember what that was. But um, yeah. Could, yeah, I can chase you off with that one. Yeah, yeah. All good. I'll move. Move to Councillor Jurisdiction. Second to Councillor Stewart. Joe. Again, sound financial management uh, from from the team. Uh, I don't see any uh, any areas here of uh, of grave concern. Capital Works are uh, uh, keeping. Uh, Keeping time, we've got a lot of uh, a lot of end of financial year um, payments to come through, but uh, everything's on track. No, no, no red lights flashing, and uh, and no major discrepancies to uh, to concern us. And considering where we are with uh, having gone through a COVID year, I think that's a pretty pretty good position to be in. So thank you to you and your team, and uh, to all staff that uh, ensure that we uh, we retain that uh, sound financial position, which was backed up by. Um, Treasury through the uh, through the, yeah. the week before that I uh, unfortunately missed, but uh, Me too. well done. Thanks. Will the councillors speak? No. Okay. Good the motion. Those in favour? That's unanimous. Thank you, Michael. Thank Thanks, you, Michael. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, Michael. Thank you. Councillors, that is uh, the last item on the agenda. Yeah. Declare the meeting closed, and thank you very much.